Cooperation and Collaboration of Universitas Ponegoro, Professor Dr. Insinyur Ambarianto, Regional Focal Point Asia Pacific of Sustainable Development Solutions Network Youth, Ms. Sitara Kumbale, Head of Ecoenzyme Team of UI Green Metric World University Rankings Network, Dr. Insinyur Nurzaina Ginting, who will join us as a speaker during the Ecoenzyme Workshop this afternoon. Distinguished guests, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Shalom, Namo Buddhaya. May peace be upon us, greetings of virtue. Good morning and welcome to the day two of the first International Student Leader Meeting 2022. And ladies and gentlemen, to commence today's event, we kindly invite Vice Rector for Academic and Student Affairs of Universitas Ipanagoro, Professor Faisal, SMSE PhD, to deliver the opening speech. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning Excellencies, Rektor Universitas Diponegoro The keynote speakers Minister of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati or representing Ibu Diah Roro Esti Widya Putri Member of the Commission 7 of the Indonesian House Representatives Professor Ambarianto, Vice Rector for Research Innovation and Collaboration, Universitas Diponegoro, Ms. Sitara Kumbali, the Regional Focal Point Asia Pacific of the Sustainable Development Solution Network Youth, Vice Rectors, Dean, Faculty members, students, and all the participants of the first International Student Leader Meeting 2022. Alhamdulillah, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty God, for all His mercy and love, so we can come together for this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to say congratulations to the SDG Center of Universitas Diponegoro for successfully initiating and organizing the meeting. This year, the theme of the first International Student Leader Meeting 2022 is Collective Action for Transforming Sustainable University in the Post-Pandemic. Of course, the theme is highly relevant to the current issues. Global crisis caused by the pandemic of COVID-19 since early 2020 can conciliation the word commitment to the 2030 agenda for sustainability development. How the new condition created by the pandemic have affected the interdependencies between SDGs. For example, how the effects relate to health and well-being, quality education, decent work and economic growth, consumption and production, and also the climate action. Universitas Diponegoro is committed to continuously promote sustainability, leadership, inclusiveness, and innovation are main pillars to ensure Universitas Diponegoro as the leading green campus nationally and globally. The SDG Center, Universitas Diponegoro, as the study center for sustainability development goals, can carry out its strategic role as an educational and knowledge institution that can organize scientific study activities in the field of sustainability development goals. Some substantive action that UNDIP has carried out 
in supporting the implementation of SDGs in the university sector, such as UNDIP has implemented and adopted a security system according to standards that are available in all buildings to ensure the safety and security throughout the campus. UNDIP also provides health facilities for students, academic and administrative staff according to the standards. The existence of basic health facilities is almost available in all buildings. While the hospital is on the main campus that can be accessed for students and staff also for public and community surrounding. UNDIP committed to conduct and fully implement continuous conservation of plant, animal, wildlife, genetic resources, and food, also agriculture in the form of several conservation campus program, as well as building medium and long-term conservation facilities. UNDIP also committed to reduce the amount of energy required as a solution to the problem of minimizing greenhouse gas emission by implementing the energy efficient appliances such as smart building, solar panel, and hydropower. UNDIP is committed to develop and apply sustainable waste management practices and the principle of reduce, reuse, and recycle. Some of the programs such as recycling program, reduce paper and plastic. Universitas Diponegoro also committed to continuously support the achievement of SDG 6 related to the clean water and sanitation by carrying out various programs and implementation such as water conservation and water recycling programs. Also, as we see uh, today that SDGs Universitas Diponegoro provided and offer sustainability subject courses, cultural events, research funds, and student organization such as, as the first international student leader meeting today. Therefore, this uh, event is highly relevant for raising awareness of the importance of sustainability and human resources required for its realization and maintenance and in communities and universities. The second, this event relevant for providing the exchange and the exchange of sustainability related experiences among students' organizations of various global universities and also fostering the development of sustainable leaders. I trust the student leader meeting will be energized by your voices and perspectives and of course the students' contribution to the learning environment in the context SDGs remains essential and leave an imprint. Expose your views, let your leadership is being heard. To all parties who participated and contributed, I would like to thank very much. Thank you. Wabilahi Taufiq walidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Kindly invite Vice Rector for the Academic and Student Affairs to stay in front for a photo session. Prof. Faisal berkenan untuk foto bersama. And also we would like to invite all delegates, ladies and gentlemen, to please kindly come forward for a photo session, for another photo session. Untuk teman-teman Humas, mohon bantuannya untuk dapat mengatur foto bersama dan juga mengambil gambar dari seluruh peserta pada pagi hari ini.
please to Okay, one, two, three. It's okay, please feel free to pose as you like. Two thumbs or one thumb? One thumb. <laughs> that will be difficult. Okay. One more picture or two more pictures? <laughs> One more picture. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Very well, thank you very much for the photo session. And distinguished guests, delegates and ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the first plenary session, followed by discussion. And it is an honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Joining us now online, we'll speak about facing a global economic recession in 2023, what young generation can do. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Minister, Special Advisor to Minister of Finance for Regional Fiscal Policy Formulation Affairs, Staff Khusus Menteri Keuangan Bidang Perumusan Kebijakan Fiskal Regional Kementerian Keuangan, Ibu Titi Anas. Selamat pagi, Ibu Titi Anas. Good morning. Selamat pagi, Ibu. Apa Sorry. Bisa mendengar? <coughs> Sorry, can you hear my voice? Yes. Huh? <coughs> we can hear your voice, Ibu Titi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and Good to morning. guide. Good morning. And to guide delivery of the keynote speech, kindly being invited to the front as the moderator, Ibu Bulan Prabowani, SOS MM, PhD. <clears throat> For the moderator, you may start the session. The Honorable of Vice Rector for Academic and Student Affairs of Universitas Diponegoro, Professor Faisa. The Honorable Ibu Dr. Titi Anas for the keynote speaker for this session and distinguished guests. Uh, please welcome to the event of, uh, to, please welcome to the second day of the International Student Leader Meeting 2022 in Semarang. It is such an honor for me to be uh, the moderator for this session. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, global society now is in a challenge to coping with economic recession 2023. And the recession due to the food and energy crisis as the impact of Ukraine war, as well as uh, that the business still unable to perform in a good shape after the pandemic COVID-19. And also nowadays, we have uh, the rise of interest rate but uh, ladies and gentlemen, now Indonesia, India, Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam is assumed to be able to uh, resist towards the recession. 
And for the probability for Indonesia, for the recession is only 3%. So here we have Dr. Titi Anas to discuss, uh, to ensure we, that we able to follow the scenario, scenario of Indonesian government to cope with the crisis, so we able to resist with the recession. We should have here Ibu uh, Ministry of Finance, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, PhD. However, she unable to join us here, but don't worry, we have Ibu Titi Anas, Ibu Dr. Titi Anas. Thank you very much, Ibu. Uh, I would like to read a brief curriculum vitae of Ibu Titi Anas. She graduated from Universitas uh, Indonesia for the bachelor degree. And she graduated also from Australian National University for both the master and uh, doctoral degree. And Ibu Titi already write a book entitled with Keeping Indonesia Safe for the COVID-19 Pandemic. And Ibu Titi now is the special advisory for Indonesian Ministry of Finance. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, before we start the meeting, I'd like to read a pantun. Yeah, so pantun is a traditional oral poetic form to express ideas or emotion. Wait a second. Uh, please say cakep ya. Mentari terbit belumlah tinggi. Jalan sendiri menunggu fajar. Assalamualaikum, selamat pagi. Semoga acara ini berjalan lancar. Uh, but don't worry for those who speak in English. I have an English version. The color of this screen is blue. Such a good day to meet you. My heart is flowering. Please enjoy the meeting. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bapak Ibu and ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, we have Ibu uh, Titi Anas here. Uh, Bu Titi Anas, you have 30 minutes to present. Please, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Ibu Bulan. Uh, good morning, um, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to uh, say warm greetings to uh, Professor Faisal, uh, the Vice Rector, who already opened uh, today's uh, session uh, by outlining uh, excellent progress of University of uh, Diponegoro, Dip Diponegoro University on SDG. Uh, the other university uh, should uh, um, follow the steps that uh, Universitas Diponegoro already um, uh, did. Uh, I would like also to uh, greet uh, the Honorable uh, Mrs. Dia Roro S.T. Widya Putri, the member of Commission 7 of the Indonesian House of Representatives, the Honorable Mrs. Sitara Kumbala, Regional Focal Point of uh, SDG uh, Solution Network uh, for Youth, and Honorable Speakers who attend today's meeting. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, first of, first of all, I would like to um, uh, send the apology uh, from our minister who cannot attend or present uh, to you the keynote speech uh, due to um, another commitment that she cannot um, avoid. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, as Ibu Bulan already uh, presented to you the challenge that we are facing, it's not an easy one. It's an uh, increase over time due to pandemic, and the war in uh, Ukraine. And this, of course, um, provide a challenge to everyone, not only those in the government, but also public in general, including the youth. 
So it is very timely that the youth gathered here in Semarang to discuss the SDG because SDG is going to be one going to be affected significantly by the downturn of the economy. So I, I would like to express my sincere high appreciation to students and the university who arranged this event. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic may alter the course of policy throughout the world. Yet, as if it's not enough, another disaster that already mentioned earlier, the war also erupted. And this not only affecting the economies that is in conflict, but also the rest of the world. We have the supply chain disrupted, the energy price increased uh, uh, substantially and the food price also increased substantially, not only in Ukraine, but all over the world. The pandemic and the war are a lethal combination. All activities, export, import and other economy activities put on a hold causing the rest of the world to face an economic slowdown. The economic slowdown and recession in some countries leads to increased unemployment due to many companies decrease their budget and uh, resulted in um, termination of their employee. We, we heard that around the world, so many layoffs, so many unemployed workers as an implication of the pandemic and uh, the consequences of the war. Even before the pandemic and the war, some emerging countries were facing problems with poverty and social problems. That's why the SDG come very, very important. The, pan the pandemic and war have made the existing problem harder to handle. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia is part of G20 and ASEAN. Among the G20 and ASEAN countries, Indonesia is one of the countries that has been able to recover relatively quickly from the pandemic. As I uh, put in the chat box, we have we have already uh, documented what we have been doing with the pandemic handling so that it can be a lesson learned for all countries. The book is free for download from our website, but it's also available through ISIS publishing company in Singapore for download as well. Indonesia's economic fundamental has remained solid and robust providing it with a strong foundation for facing the global headwind. Our GDP growth, as you may know, had continued to thrive this year, growing at 5% in quarter one, 5.4% in quarter two, and 5.7% consecutively in quarter three. In. So we have a very solid foundation. The stronger economic recovery has been supported primarily by buoyant the domestic demand and solid export growth. Effective pandemic handling and various policy support, both on the demand to support the purchasing power of our people through social assistance and subsidies and supply side support, such as tax relief for companies, some subsidies and financing support have also been instrumental in cushioning the impact as well as the to re jumpstart our economic activity post pandemic. Stronger economic activities have sustained the improvement in the labor market. We witnessed that the unemployment rate declined from 6.49% in September, in August 2021 to 5.86% in October 2022. So we have made progress, although the progress still 
need to be accelerated if we want to achieve the high income countries in uh, in 100 a years of Indonesian um, uh, anniversary, which is 2045. Indonesia's international trade has continued to strengthen. In October 2022, the trade balance recorded a surplus of 5.67 billion US dollar. It is 30 months straight of surplus. In the past, before the pandemic, we often have our trade balance in deficit. What does it mean? It means that we import more than what we can export. In October 2022, however, our export grew by 12.3%. It is a very high growth, while import also increased by 17%. Import is not bad, export is not also bad because of the because of the need of goods and services in every country and that country have um, limited resources. So it is based on trade theory that countries should embark on international trade so they can specialize in the things that they can do best and uh, import the things that they cannot do efficiently so our export grew and our import also grew leaving the uh, the, the the country with a surplus of trade balance the increase in Indonesia export was driven by non-oil and gas export, which is grew by 11.45%, mainly coming from animal and vegetable fats and oil, which is CPO that we know, crude palm oil, as well as mineral fuel, iron and steel. Meanwhile, oil and gas export increased by 29.2%. However, our non-oil gas uh, export are the product uh, predominant of our export. So the largest share of our export are the non-oil. So it's worth noting here that they remain strong Indonesia export performance amid the global slowdown. It's partly due to a market shift as export to relatively strong performing countries such as India, which is jumped very significantly our export there for by 84% uh, in October 2022. And we also witness our export to uh, our traditional market means that our regular export destination uh, also are going strong. In regard to investment, our Indonesia is all is is remain uh, attractive to investors. We witness that direct investment is strengthened. The total direct investment in Indonesia in quarter three, 2022, was recorded at 307 a trillion rupiah, 42% higher than the same period last year. Foreign direct investment increased by 63.6%. So it's not only from domestic investors that we receive investment, but also for, from other countries. The direct investment performance revealed that the Indonesian market is still appealing amid global risk. So we are among the what we call it as the light, uh, the shining light uh, uh, around uh, the world from the emerging country. The investment has created job uh, opportunities for new job seekers, absorbing around 307,000 workers. The 2022 economic growth outlook will remain strong. We still have another quarter to finish this year. We are currently in quarter four, uh, 2022. The projection is mainly based on the fact that the household consumption remain relatively strong, supported by ample liquidity 
robust export and accelerated infrastructure project execution. Indonesia is uh, prominent for its infrastructure development in the past few years. We have spent more than 700 trillion to uh, build infrastructure throughout the country. You see new um, airports, new city ports, new um, roads and bridges built around, uh, around uh, across the country. Learning from the experience of the 2011-2012 commodity boom, the economic trajectory will capitalize on the co uh, commodity uh, super cycle, we call it, the high price commodity. The ongoing reform agenda that the government is undertaking so that we can lead the country into the prosperous 2045 aspiration. We are quite optimistic that this year's growth rate could be in the range of 5 to 5.3%. So it's quite high compared to other countries. Ladies and gentlemen, not only Indonesia projected high growth for uh, its economy, but also the World Bank and the IMF respectively. The government budget, if we talk about what the government is doing, the government budget, which is the money comes from the, its people uh, who pay taxes, is instrumental in ushering the economy into this current juncture. The government budget has provided a cushion to prevent a deeper contraction and minimize the scarring effect of the pandemic. Amid the current persistent global inflationary pressure, the government budget has played a critical role in maintaining the purchasing power of the people through energy subsidies so that the stronger economic recovery can be sustained. Our 40% uh, bottom household received uh, additional top up during the, uh, the price increase, the, the, the fuel uh, price increase. Nonetheless, the government continued to seek the right balance between boosting economic recovery and safeguarding the medium to long term fiscal sustainability. Not only we live today, but also we live for many years to come, especially uh, the budget support has to support the, its people, the Indonesian people, not only this year, but also for the future. Thus, Indonesia has adopted a flexible but prudent approach to fiscal policy management under the current circumstances. The strong 2022 budget performance continued. Up to the first nine months of 2022, the government budget continued to record a surplus amounting 60.9 trillion or 0.33% of our GDP. The total government revenue collected went up significantly by 45.7%. So in contrast to other countries uh, facing a slowing down in their, uh, in their revenue, we are collecting more basically. So this significantly increase uh, make the revenue collection of almost 2,000 trillion. Tax collection is even more astounding, growing at 49.3% and worth 1.5 trillion in total. So for the government of Indonesia, apart from tax collection, we also have revenue from the profit of our SOEs and other collection. Who got, but in terms of taxes, who contribute most? The mining, the trade sector, and the manufacturing contribute the majority of our tax of, of our tax revenue. Nonetheless, tax revenue from all sectors regard, recorded significant uh, growth, reflecting a broad-based economic recovery. We should be thankful uh, of this broad-based economic recovery. Non-tax revenue increased strongly also, supported by the increase in almost all components of the back of higher uh, commodity prices, better performance of our SO SOEs, and an improvement in public service 
non-tax revenue up to September 2022 increased by 34.4% compared to the previous year of um, 431 trillion. So in terms of revenue, we are very well uh, in uh, this year to face the, the, the challenge that the global uh, economy posed to us. And how about the spending? The tax and all the revenue collected by the government are used for public uh, purpose. And we see this year as well as uh, the Minister of Finance always uh, presented to public monthly on the progress of our revenue collection and the budget disbursement. And as a way of a background, uh, in our 2022 budget document, the government expenditure uh, is focusing on uh, supporting the economic recovery program, national strategic project and social assistance. As September 2022, the government has dispersed 1,900 trillion of spending or about 61.6% uh, of our total budget. Out of this amount, 686 trillion is disbursed for non-line ministry spending, including subsidies and compensation for fuel uh, and uh, fuel and electricity, who, which is increased uh, in a uh, in the past a few months due to the the war in Ukraine, of course, that make uh, many countries alive uh, miserable. Excuse me. Uh, apologize for that. Financing has been maintained considerably. You know, uh, if a country uh, have a revenue uh, short uh, than its spending, there should be a financing for the deficit. Let me turn off my headphone first. So it's not disturbing. Okay. Uh, apologize for that. So when countries new collection uh, less than uh, the spending the, the there is a need for financing and for indonesia financing of the deficit of the uh, budget has been maintained considerably well with the net def debt deficit or financing uh, until the end of september 2022 reached 478 uh, trillion a decrease of 60 uh, a decrease of uh, 26 percent uh, compared to last year and this is good uh, because initially we planned a higher budget deficit but we are looking for a, a less uh, budget deficit this year because of the well uh, managed uh, the revenue which is increased significantly and the budget uh, well managed uh, within the plan for Indonesia, the year 2022 is critical milestone on our fiscal consolidation plan, where we'll go back on implementing our budget discipline of a maximum deficit of 3% of the GDP by next year, as mandated by the emergency law. In handling the pandemic, the, the government introduced an emergency regulation that later enacted by the parliament as emergency law. Uh, kita, we, we call it Undang-Undang 2 Tahun 2020. As you all know, so far the 2022 government budget performance looks impressive with remarkable revenue collection as the key factor. Therefore, the budget deficit is expected to be lower as I mentioned earlier than the initial target and so is the financing needs as well as a bond issuance target is lower. At the end of semester one, we stated to the parliament that the budget deficit outlook could be lower to 3.9% of the GDP, much lower than the initial budget uh, deficit plan of 4 0.85% of GDP. The number continues to improve and we're now anticipating at even lower budget deficit. This is very in line with our commitment to bring down the state budget deficit to normal level.
from 6.14% in 2020 to 2.84% 2 in 2023. So it's, we experienced huge budget deficit when handling the COVID in 2020, but with discipline, we are going to bring it down into uh, 2023 to uh, below 3% uh, as mandated by our uh, 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 law. So ladies and gentlemen, that's about our fiscal management. And we would like to share with you that uh, how about uh, COVID and uh, the, the economy? We know that the unprecedented incidents such as COVID-19 has destroyed economy of the whole world, not only Indonesia. We experience study from home. And as a result of this COVID-19, the GDP of the whole world is going down. As the line in the Lord of the Rings says, winter is coming. It was coming during the 2020 and 2021 for some country is still still it is still winter these days and that uh, uh, and the hardship we managed to survive in 2020 and 2021 but many countries still experience the difficult situation so we 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 have to contribute to the world and indonesia has contributed to the world through g20 in handling uh, how the global economy should respond to the challenges and as we enter the year 2023 we can clearly see that many big companies have started to lay off their employees so this is still the winter is still uh, experienced in many countries but less so in Indonesia. As we enter the year 2023, we can clearly see that many big companies started to lay off their employees as small companies have stopped their operation and so on. We see from the big tech company do this and some startup also experience this. The recession can have some snowball effect on attaining the world's SDG due to the downturn of the economy, as I mentioned earlier. So it is SDG is among others that are going to be affected by COVID-19 and the war. The, the, as a young person, you, the audience, the leaders in this room have the opportunity to help the world achieve the SDG on track and so that we can achieve the, the, the SDG as we plan. There are numbers of action you can take to assist the government in meeting the SDG, the goals amid the recession. Here, uh, the leaders in this room, you can start by taking a small step. Remember what Edwin Aldrin said when he landed on the moon for the first time? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That's you what, you what, what you are going to uh, do uh, by attending this event. You can start by organizing your trash. That's a very small step. Ensuring efficient use of electricity. That's another small step. Proposing some implementable policy for your government, that's a big step that you can do as well. Or even creating job opportunity for others through any endeavor, any starting entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial uh, activities uh, with your friends at, uh, on campus and so on. As future leaders, you have all the time in the world to plan your action and turn it into something big. Everything starts small and it can, be, it can become big, like what we have with Gojek and so on. It all starts small. Cooperation is the key to reaching the goal, whether it is the cooperation between you and the government or the cooperation between you and your friend around the world. You are lucky to be in the, this room that you have friends from other countries. 
We be patient and creative in implementing the plan. And lastly, be confident that you can pass this challenge episode. The world is not in its normal way of doing business. Some countries experience high inflation, low growth, but we can pass this as well. Towards Indonesia's dream of becoming the golden generation of 2045, that's our 100 independence aspiration, the young Indonesians should have a comprehensive intelligence, namely productive and innovative, peaceful in social integration, and have Indonesian strong character and superior civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, and the youth leader that I admire, have a fruitful meeting and have the best time in Semarang. Just remember that history repeats itself. The predicted recession in 2023 is not unprecedented. We experience, although not our generation, but the past generation also experienced uh, some kind of recession in the past. It had happened a few times in this century as well. You can study what policy that has been implemented to overcome the incident uh, during the century. And you can also from the book that we just published, what, how, how can a country recover from the pandemic from Indonesia's experience? The important thing is that we do not panic and be always creative. And God helps us. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, thank you very much, Ibu Titi Anas, for the valuable insight. While we also coping with uh, many hoax information there, here we able to hear directly from uh, the Ministry of Finance, yeah, the representative of Ministry of Finance about the valid data and how our economics. Uh, I have made several notes here. The first is that uh, we are now confident, especially for Indonesian, that our economics is in a very good shape. Yeah, uh, for example. We able to recover from the pandemic very soon, and then the unemployment rate decreased significantly. The third one also the performance of trade in Indonesia is surplus of trade of balance, and then uh, as well as the um, yeah export performance, and then uh, the investment rate, both for foreign and domestic investment rate in Indonesia is increased. 40% compared to uh, the last year performance. And then we able to see, we able to enjoy the infrastructure development. Uh, now we have 5.5% of uh, economic growth rate. And then we have prudent fiscal policy. And um, yeah, in which 45% of government revenue is increasing yeah uh, some of those also contributed by the performance of state owned enterprises and in terms of spending yeah uh, the spending of the government is majority for uh, the pandemic uh, recovery yeah and then uh, for subsidy subsidy and um, ladies and gentlemen also ibu titi has provide uh, ways on how we able to contribute to uh, the economic recovery by, for example, yeah, um, by SDGs, uh, in which SDGs here it has target and indicators. Then uh, we should contribute to the target and indicators by doing small steps. What are they? Uh, because we are, oh, you are young generation. I am still young, I think. <laughs> yeah, by creating job opportunity uh, for entrepreneurship and then plan your action for something big. So hopefully all of you able to be, what is it, like Bapak Nadi Makarim with Gojek and uh, Tokopedia and the others. And uh, the last one, cooperation is 
the key yeah so uh, again uh, we should uh, give applause to those country who able to perform well in a time of pandemics please give your applause And now, ladies and gentlemen, we still have uh, yeah, 25 minutes for uh, QA. Should you have any question, please raise your hand. And please also for the committee to help the audience. Oh, many questions there. Yes, uh, all of those from the center. Please mention yes. your name yes, yes. and where are you from? Okay. Then uh, good morning, uh, everybody. So my name is Dakar Ramadan. I'm from the Islamic State University of Raden Intan Lampung or Indonesian Uin Raden Intan Lampung. So welcome to Indonesia for all, all the foreigners. And uh, yeah, my my question. Okay, just a real quick question. Uh, we are facing a global uh, economic recession, right? And um, we are. Uh, as a youth generation are demanded to save our budget as much as possible so that we are not trapped in this um, uh, in this recession but um, at the same time if we, if we do that the roles of economy will not uh, will not go will not flow uh, better means like our economy will stop and at the same time we are a youth generation loves to do shopping and uh, it means that we will spend a lot of budget do, do you think uh, do you think is that is a wise uh, wise action to keep spending budget in this um, in this kind of uh, economic recession? Thank you so much. That's my question. So again, I didn't hear you clearly, as you are from Uyen, right? Yes. And your name is Daka. Data. D A K A. Daka. D A T A. K. Daka. Uh -uh. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Interesting name. <laughs> so you are asking about uh, what is it that we have to keep spending, yeah, to make uh, our economic steady. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the second question, please. Yes. Yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so welcome to Indonesia. My name is Andini Rizka Marieta from Telkom University. So thank you for the insightful presentation from Mrs. Titi. Here I would like to give my um, question and self-analysis about the current situation briefly. So without taking off the optimism from recession handling as young people, we believe and I personally believe that joint or mutual cooperation among society is truly crucial for maintaining national situation being away from recession. But unfortunately, joint cooperation for handling recession will be hardly established without the improvement of individual knowledge and ability about financial literacy, as well as Minister Sri Mulyani said in the event of Literasi Keuangan Indonesia Terdepan on 2021. So, in vague financial literacy, is still not fully involved in our educational material up to now, even though it's much more crucial nowadays side by side with digital literacy. So my question is about what kind of effective movement which is supposed to do by educational field with young people involvement to do in order to play a role in this case regarding Ms. Titi perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mbak Andini. Ibu Titi, are you convinced with uh, the first two questions or you need more questions? I think uh, two questions first. We can, we can address these two questions, uh, these two important questions, I guess, Bu Bulan. Yeah, okay, thank you, Ibu Titi, please. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Andini, uh, the name is quite long, so I apologize that I didn't catch your name fully, the one uh, from Telkom University. Those are two important uh, questions, yeah. 
uh, first I start from uh, the last question that we need joint cooperation. Yes, indeed. Indonesia already showed to the world that we can establish joint cooperation through G20. Why is it very um, uh, worth uh, mentioning this um, achievement of Indonesia in G20? Because Russia is there, right? The one that is in conflict with Ukraine is in G20. But we manage, Indonesia managed through its presidency, through its leadership as a, a president of G20. Uh, an agreement, a lot of agreement among the G20 leaders about how to handle the global crisis. Among others is that the pandemic fund, we established 1.5 billion US dollar fund to handle pandemic in the future. It was not uh, achieved or it was not successfully established last year during Italy's uh, presidency, but we can establish it during Indonesian uh, uh, presidency. So it is worth mentioning. We also established a commitment on uh, uh, energy transition to more renewable, I think part of the SDG, and so many other uh, uh, commitment uh, among the G20 elite. also uh, part of the commitment in G20. So we are we are influencing global economy. Indonesia is in the global uh, 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 leadership role. So that's your um, uh, model, yeah? Uh, that's your, uh, uh, what is it, a, a equipment to be part of the global uh, discussion to handle pandemic or other global challenges as a youth leader. So um, in terms of uh, financial literacy and digital literacy, you are right, very, very right about the importance of those two. You read in the news that so many Indonesians are being fooled by uh, Pinjol, right, the online uh, own, uh, providers, yeah, that should not happen if Indonesians, either it is general public or students understand about the cost of borrowing money and how you are responsibly use the money if you borrow money from anywhere. So if you borrow, there must be cost of the uh, loan, right? Either small or large. And you have to study any contract of borrowing that you have with any parties. So basically, the, the uh, understanding about financial, what you call as financial liter literacy, and understanding about how the digital world uh, work are very two important elements of uh, what we have to expedite the knowledge about. And of course, through the, the respective ministries and institutions, uh, in their program have uh, the acceleration process, like for example, the OJK and the Bank Indonesia and also the Ministry of Finance, um, are part of the financial uh, literacy uh, uh, um, um, and inclusion uh, effort, yeah, uh, jointly. And on digital uh, literacy, as you know, we still have the digital divide. Some of the Indonesians are very, very tech savvy, but majority of Indonesians, especially in the rural area, are not yet understand about using the smartphone. So students like you the youth leaders can contribute to this as well in your kkn for example you can put uh, the digital literacy uh, improvement as part of your program so that the 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 farmers in the rural area can sell their products quickest at a higher price 
so they can be more wealthier than they used to. So maybe uh, those, uh, I hope those uh, can answer your question. So collaboration is the key. We start from global, we, we, we either it is in global area or in our uh, national or domestic um, uh, landscape. And for the DACA's question, I think um, you are also right. That's why for anyone, either it is household, you as person or government has to keep the balance between uh, spending and also the saving, right? So because uh, you not only live probably uh, this uh, today, uh, of course, with the God's willing, uh, you might live tomorrow and you might live uh, years uh, to come. So in your financial planning, that's why uh, related to the first question earlier, the financial literacy is very important. So you know how much you have to spend, uh, how much you have to save. So like the government, because of the recession, because uh, not because of the recession, because of the pandemic, we have to spend more, otherwise everything collapse. So at that time, you as the government, they don't save. They have to spend more to save their uh, population, their citizen, uh, their people, so that they are uh, kept healthy and also uh, not uh, starving. So I think the balance strike between when And uh, that's all I think, Bu Bulan. Terima kasih. Yeah, thank you very much, Ibu Titi. Um, Mbak Andini and Mas Daka, is that answering your question? I think it's a comprehensive explanation from Bu Titi, yeah? Yeah, thank you very much, Ibu Titi. And then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we still have uh, several minutes here. So, should you have any other question still from the center? Yeah, to another question, please. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Said Intambi. Saidi. Said Intambi, and uh, I'm from uh, University of Diponegoro, and I'm from Uganda. Uh, I would like uh, I would like to start yeah. by uh, saying COVID-19 is actually not the first pandemic that uh, the world is facing. It is actually probably the fifth documented pandemic, and uh, I believe that uh, the, the human population or the, or the human uh, group has been uh, shaped by uh, infectious diseases. So certainly COVID-19 is not the last pandemic. We are likely to have very many pandemics in the future. But uh, not to lose, to lose hope, we usually learn from uh, the past experience and be able to solve solutions in the future. So my question is, what has uh, Indonesia learned from uh, this pandemic that it will use to prevent economic recession in future. Uh, give me one uh, single point that I can take back to my country because uh, uh, in my country we are actually uh, currently still struggling to recover from uh, the pandemic and uh, paradoxically two months ago uh, there was an outbreak of uh, Ebola and uh, this has exhibited the uh, economic recession in my country. So maybe if you can give me one, uh, uh, one thing that I can take back to my country to prevent economic recession next time we have a pandemic or next time we have an epidemic, not to recover because prevention is better than cure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sayuri from Uganda. Yeah, the second one, please. Okay, good morning everyone. Okay, first of all, I will say thank you for Butiti for the grateful presentation. Actually, uh, my name is Rahman Fajar Agnawan. Usually my friend call me Rahman. I'm from President University, Indonesia. So for the, my question, related you your already present about the problem we facing by Indonesia countries like limited resource. So we should import cannot in export like a fossil fuel or another resource then. And for the my question, 
actually uh, in the field I see Indonesia actually has illegal mining so I think Indonesia have a more natural resource so for, uh, for the my question itself is what the government action for the illegal mining itself and also uh, actually Indonesia have many the resorts but unfortunately uh, it's more eco-friendly like a like a sun sunshine like wind and also high hydrogen itself so why the government not provide the more cost for the building and utilize the resource and this is more eco-friendly thank you yeah uh Butide, can you hear clearly about the question of the participant uh, can you yeah. repeat rahman question the last one bu bulan yeah uh, for the Ahmad question from President University, she asked about illegal mining. What the government action to cope with the illegal mining uh, issues? That would be the first. And then the second one in relate to renewable energy. Uh, what is it? The spending or what? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, your second uh, question, Ahmad. So thank you. In short, please. Okay, for the second question itself, why the government not provide the many costs for the building or and utilize okay. the renewable itself? Thank you. Yeah, so it's related to the government funding for renewable energy, Ibu. Yeah, okay, Bu. Okay, so I go directly to answer the question. Thank you, uh, Bu Bulan. So, uh, Said, Saidi, thank you very much for your question. That was a very excellent question. Uh, however, as you may know, I think I will not be able to provide the uh, correct answer to your very important question because no uh recipe fits all so it's going to be depends on what's going on in the country what situation in country what variables are uh, the variables that need to be considered in each of the particular country are maybe different so what we had what we can um what we can uh, probably share with you is that uh, we utilize all the data available to assess the situation so basically the the, the 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 process is that evaluate the problem and uh, make a forward-looking kind of anticipation of the, the the problem and try to if we if we already map up the problem and then we can uh, jot down the root of the problem and then we address uh, the root of the problem that's what we uh, did with the the, the pandemic uh, um, uh, in the past two two years which is cl clearly uh, uh, outlined in the book that we published basically what is the issue the pandemic the pandemic make that that um, uh, people cannot interact so it means that the economic activity will slow down if the economic slow down even stop actually uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 if the economy stop the government has to do something to uh, support its people so that uh, they are not starving or they are going to uh, have a demonstration riots and so on and so forth so you have to map up the problem first in order to get the solution. In uh, one of the example that we did uh, is uh, elaborated in the book. Uh, maybe can uh, use uh, as a learn uh, as a lesson learned. But once again, each country is different. Yeah, no no medicine fits for all. So like a doctor, they have to examine the the the, the patient and then by examining by exam the patient they know to be provided so uh, I hope you are not uh, disappointed with the answer but 
but we can uh, um, uh, what is it have discussion further if you like yeah uh, because you have a very important um, uh, question and very uh, mindful with your country so you're going to be a very good leader in the future for your country and the question for Rahman of course the government take actions about the illegal mining but of course you probably know that the challenge i mean the uh the the problem might not as um easy as um uh as we think yeah uh, because indonesia comprised of more than 500 uh cities and uh, municipalities we have so many uh islands and so on. So uh, the, the the regulation and the sanction is there, yeah, uh, and to, to be sure that uh, the um, infrastructure uh, to um, <clears throat> discipline or to catch the illegal mining is there. It's just that maybe if you don't see the progress, uh, because the progress is uh, much bigger than uh, uh, what we, we see uh, uh, probably. So on the renewable energy, of course, we are currently um, committed to um, reduce the uh, carbon emission. Yeah, and we already committed to uh, Paris Club. That's another, uh, sorry, Paris um, Agreement. That's another uh, multilateral uh, agreement that Indonesia supported. Uh, so to prevent the rise of the sea level that going to be affected many countries in uh, in, uh, in 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 the world uh, of the, the the rise of the sea level um, tran transition to renewable energy is part of the effort to uh, reduce the uh, carbon emission and uh, preventing the uh, the heat the substantial increase of the sea level but you know that we are if we are in transition it means that we start from uh, non-renewable right so we have already have household using the non-renewable energy companies factories that use already non-renewable energy and this needs time to transition to renewable yeah and it involves cost, I guess, yeah, uh, it will involve uh, costs. So, so it, we, we, what Ibu Menteri Keuangan already mentioned that the transition have to be just and affordable. Artinya, what does it mean? Just and affordable means that we can afford it, yeah, and it is uh, uh, adil, berkeadilan, yeah, jadi tidak dipaksakan. So, we, um, we, we, we are doing this transition, for example, what the government is doing is that um, to retire their coal uh, power generation, coal, uh, coal uh, batubara, coal power uh, electricity generation, uh, we retire them and uh, shift into the more renewable um, energy. Yeah? So we are doing it, but we don't do it like uh, today. You have to do it today. Now we know we have to do it in uh, for uh, in a just and affordable way. Sesuai dengan kemampuan kita, yeah. Uh, uh, how much we can do uh, this year? How much we can do uh, next year? But at the end of the day, we are uh, reaching the goal that we already committed to. Maybe I hope you and it answer your question. Thank you so much. Ya, yeah, thank you very much Ibu Titi. Um, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we have uh, run out of time. Should you have more question, you can uh, you can uh, note your uh, write your question into a note, small notes and then give to the committee. Then we will try to pass through the question to Ibu Titi. Ya. Yeah. And hopefully yeah, Ibu Titi would like that. to respond. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, you very much. That, Ibu. Yeah. yeah. So uh, before I close this uh, session, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, what is it? Make a an conclusion, yeah, regarding with our session here. The first is that Indonesian economy is in a good performance, 
And then, however, it needs contribution from every actor uh, to give contribution to the economy itself. And then, um, in relate to the question, yeah, how to do so? How to do in simpler ways to contribute to the economic performance? Uh, the first one, by consume wisely. Uh, spending is okay, yeah. And then use technology uh, wisely as well. And then literate to financial as literate as a financial actor. And thus, for, from overseas, uh, you can learn from uh, economic uh, Indonesia economic as a lesson learned. However, you should adjust to the characteristic and variable of economic in each of your country. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you very much, Ibu Titi, Ibu Titi Anas, and then hopefully uh, you are in a good help. And then uh, thank you very much for uh, valuable insight, and hopefully also you able to keep up maintaining the Indonesian economics in a good way. Yeah. Um, Allah, Ibu, terima kasih banyak. Yeah, thank you very much, Ibu. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's the end of our session. Um, thank you very much for the particip participation in the discussion. And then uh, I am sorry for any inconvenience. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for Ibu Bulan and also Dr. Titi Anas. Please give round of applause for our moderator and also our first keynote speaker for this morning. Very well. Distinguished guests, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, our second keynote speaker will also joining us online. She will speak about renewable energy for sustainable universities. Please welcome Member of Commission 7 of the Indonesian House of Representatives, Ibu Diaroro ST Widya Putri, BA PG Deep MSC. Hello, good morning, Ibu Diaroro. Selamat pagi, Ibu. Selamat pagi, Ibu Roro. Apakah bisa mendengar suara kami? Okay, we're still trying to connect to our next keynote speaker. And to guide the delivery of the keynote speech, kindly being invited to the front as the moderator, Bapak Rukuh Setiadi, as the MAM PhD. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, uh, Hom Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good morning to all participants uh, here in the room, particularly to students from 45 universities in 14 countries. Uh, the distinguished uh, speakers that we are still waiting for and colleges as well as to all online participants out there uh, of the International Student Leader Meeting 2022. First of all, I would like to introduce my name. My name is Ruko Stiadi. I'm a member of SDG Center of uh, University, Diponegoro University. And now we are in the second day of the meetings and uh, in this session, we will focus on renewable energy for sustainable universities. Uh, do we already have the speaker here? Not yet? Oh yes, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Ibu Dia. Uh, I think uh, it is a very important topic. 
uh, because energy is the fuel of all, almost all of sectors and almost all of our activities. And how we generate energy contributing to the extent of future climate change. And in the meantime, we know that renewable energy is emerging and is gaining popularity right now. Thank you. Yes, uh, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, renewable energy shares about 12.9% of the global energy sources. And what about the current state of the figures? And what university can do? and especially what are best role played by students. I think uh, so to give us a perspective on the, those questions, we have a, I think, young, bright, and distinguished speaker, Ms. Diaharoro S.D. Widya Putri. Okay, but before that, please be bear with me. Uh, I would like to introduce a little bit about our speaker. She has a prestigious and cool position. Yeah. She is a member of uh, Commission 7 of the Indonesia House of Representatives. The commission focuses on energy, research and innovation, and industry. She has had a broad international perspective and various uh, cultural exposure since early age. Maybe you can see from the uh, curriculum vitae. For example, she spent elementary school in Beijing, China, and Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Uh, high school, guess where is it? The high school? High school in Jakarta. Yeah, uh, high school in Jakarta. Exactly in Jakarta Intercultural School. And then undergrad for University of Manchester and postgraduate courses from Harvard University, as well as master study from Imperial College London. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Ibu Dia. Please take your virtual stage and please enlighten all of us here. Time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, for that really kind introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Universitas Diponegoro, for the invitation. I do apologize that I'm not able to be there in person because of my very hectic schedule. I'm, I'm, and I'm actually not feeling very well today. So um, I've decided to stay in a bit uh, for a bit at home, but then continuing on in the next hour. But um, as for today, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, the topic that was mentioned earlier with regards to renewable energy for sustainable universities. I tried to kind of um, uh, make this presentation the about, you know, how Indonesia right now is going about in terms of climate change mitigation, um, particularly within the energy sector, what kind of steps we're currently taking in order to find the correct uh, solutions, and also some examples uh, of universities and other buildings alike that have incorporated sustainable practices. So if we could go uh, to the next slide. Um, when we speak of climate change or the climate crisis, uh, this coincides with several financial losses. For example, in, in Indonesia, if we are not optimal in terms of our climate change mitigation, this is estimation for 2024, we have the potential loss of around 81.82 uh, trillion rupiah um, with the result of the rise in sea level resulting in the sinking of isolated islands or flooding. We also have the potential of losing around 7.29 trillion rupiah um, as a result of increased temperature at sea level, which can result in coral bleaching, as well as uh, it having an impact on fish production. Also within the agriculture sector, around 19.94 uh, trillion rupiah 
losses uh, coinciding with forest fires and continuous dry seasons. Um, and also uh, in, within the health sector, around 6.48 trillion rupiah um, caused by respiratory problems caused by uh, air pollution. And uh, this is all sourced from the low carbon development Indonesia, in which I have the pleasure of being one of the commissioners uh, alongside very prominent figures, including our former vice president of Indonesia, Bapak Yusuf Kala. And if we can go to the next slide. So these are just some of the economic losses. But I do also want to highlight the time of gains that we are able to obtain when we optimize on a low carbon development. So um, the National Development Planning Agency or BAPANAS have launched, as I mentioned earlier, the LCDI and based on the report that has been um, established, we have the potential of creating more than 1.8 to 15.3 million additional jobs by 2030 and 2045, which are considered to be or considerably more green um, and higher in terms of the pay. Uh, we can reduce extreme poverty by 4.2% of the population by 2045. Uh, we are also able to save 40,000 lives every year. You can imagine by reducing air and water pollution. I think a lot of people don't recognize the great impact in which air and water pollution has on human life. And um, particularly with air pollution, this is something that we cannot see, just like the COVID uh, pandemic. You know, this is not something we're able to see, but it's de uh, deadly. And so um, when we do, you know, when we maximize on low carbon development, we're able to save that many lives. And also we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43% in 2030, which is uh, higher than the expected or the target in which has been set through the uh, Conference of the Parties or COP21 Paris Agreements back in 2015, which has been ratified through law uh, 16 year 2016 at the Indonesian parliament alongside with the government with uh, the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 29%. So I'd like to highlight firstly in this slide with regards to the kind of benefits that we can obtain when we do put forth low carbon development in our country. Now, when we speak of the energy sector, particularly because we're speaking of the renewables aspect, if we go to the next slide, I'd like to kind of uh, convey to everybody present today with regards to the fact that the energy sector contributes roughly 30% of our overall emissions um, in, in the country. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a target of decreasing greenhouse gas emissions by 29%. But when we speak of the emissions generally on a national level in Indonesia, 30% of it comes from the energy sector. And so uh, when we speak of our energy portfolio, this is majority predominantly fueled by the fossil fuel industry. Um, however, uh, I think actually I'd like to also additionally point out that 70% of our currently more or less, yeah, more or less 70% of our electricity um, is coming from the fossil fuel industry as well. So majority is coal that is being optimized for our electricity right now in the country. Um, however, I'd like to also highlight the fact that fossil fuels have an expiry date. So when we speak of the oil, um, we have a remaining of 4.17 billion uh, barrels, uh, estimating to run out in 9.5 years down the line. When we speak of gas, this has the potential of running out in 19.9 years down the line. And coal, it has a li higher life expectancy of 65 years down the line. But all in all, uh, as a, a, a cumulatively, we know that each of these resources have an expiry date unless we are able to do further exploration in this field alone. Um, and as we see from the graph here, uh, we derived this graph from the Indonesia Energy Outlook. Uh, from the years 2020 to 2050, uh, we predict that energy consumption and energy demand will continuously rise. 
Okay, so taking note that there is an expiry date to fossil fuels. However, we also know that the energy demand will continuously rise over the course of time. And this is very much in line with um, the, the, the growth of our our economic growth, sorry, our economic growth in terms of the GDP as well, and the potential of being one of the largest economies in the world by 2045, maximizing on our bonus uh, demographic dividend. And so uh, with that being said, um, there needs to be an effort for us to diversify our energy portfolio so that we do not experience an energy crisis. If we rely solely on fossil fuel, we will not, and I can guarantee that we will not be able to, to survive in the years to come. Um, that's why it's very important with the hopes of also mitigating climate change, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we also explore the renewable energy space. So if we can go to the next slide, there's a lot of potential for the renewable energy sector um, all across different parts of Indonesia. For example, uh, here in the slide, uh, if we can go to the next slide, there are so many different examples from different parts of the country come uh, stretching from uh, Sumatra to Maluku, Sulawesi, even the Javanese islands as well. And um, uh, when we speak of the installed capacity of renewable energy, when we speak of electricity, with that, and with that being said, only 0.34% of our total potential has been realized. I'm not sure if the slides are um, or if you're able to see on the screen here, the slide that, that I'm talking about, because on my screen, it's still on the energy. Yeah, this is the one. So here I'd like to highlight that there are so many potentials for renewables, whether we speak of hydro, hydro power spreading, spreading all over Indonesia, particularly as you can see on the map, North Kalimantan, North Sumatra, and also Papua. Uh, when we speak of solar, spreads pretty much all over the country as well, particularly in Timoria, yeah? so in East Nusa Tenggara, uh, as well as West Kalimantan and Rio have big potential for this. Wind power, we know uh, the famous one called Sidrap, uh, which is in Makassar, but there, in general, there are um, potential for this in East Nusa Tenggara, South Kalimantan, West Java, Papua as well. Ocean spreads across the country. As we know, we are the biggest archipelago in the world. Geothermal um, spreads in the ring of fire areas, particularly in Sumatra, Jawa, Bali, uh, Nusa Tenggara, Sulawesi, and Maluku. Uh, it's so important to also to highlight that we, um, I think around 40% of the world's geothermal reserves actually resides in Indonesia. So this slide is pretty much trying to convey to everybody um, in terms of the statistics and the facts uh, in which Indonesia has high potential for renewable energy to grow. Um, so what are some of the barriers that we are currently facing with regards to renewable energy? If we can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of the regulation, we have ratified the Paris Agreement. Yes, we have committed to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, as I mentioned earlier. Um, also, we have Una Undang Energy as well, with the hopes of, you know, having 23% renewables by 2025. Um, and also, uh, there are so many other uh, targets as well politically. However, one of the things that we currently need is a political framework uh, and policy that is very much focused thoroughly and solely on the uh, in the development of renewable energy in our country. So when we look at the political landscape on a national and general level on the next slide, President, uh, President Joko Widodo is very much committed on this. Um, and this has been exemplified in several means, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the times in which he has came to the parliament so uh, the president has has um, has presented to us in parliament of 
this need and this urgency for energy transition, um, as well as if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm not able to operate my slides from here. Yes, this slide is the one. Um, and also the coordinating minister for economic affairs, Bapak Erlangga Hartarto has also, uh, who is head Sherpa, uh, chair Sherpa of the G20. Um, has also increasingly uh, declared the urgency really for energy transition in our country. So there is great momentum for this. And for those of you who have followed the, you know, uh, uh, the progress through the G20, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we have what's called the energy transition mechanism. Indonesia has obtained a commitment from the Just Energy Transition Partnership if we can go to the next slide, uh, amounting to around uh, 20 US, bil uh, US billion dollars. However, there are a lot of prerequisites that we need to fulfill in order for us to secure this funding. And this is something that I uh, actually highlighted yesterday during our meeting with the Minister of uh, Energy with regards to the fact that the J JetP um, so I'm so sorry for this. This It's not supposed to be GTEP, but it's supposed to be JET and then um, apostrophe P. So the JET P is, um, is currently being discussed by the government. And I also pushed the Minister of uh, Energy yesterday for us to be able to sorry, for the government to be able to present to us the concrete steps in which they can fulfill in order for our country to then obtain this um, this this funding of 20 billion US dollars. So some of the prerequisite, prerequisites include uh, the the ability for Indonesia to, to reach net zero emissions by 2050. This is very challenging for us because our target on a national level is uh, to set forth for 2060. Also, there needs to be a stop on the development of new power plants that are fueled by coal and also the, the need for um, retirement of uh, coal power plants as well. And this is something that we need to push the government to really just ask how serious they are in order to achieve something like this and also generally a decrease of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, uh, which may potentially be higher than the one set by the COP, Paris, uh, COP agreement. There are um, uh, a, li a little bit of an update to the, the decrease of greenhouse gas emissions as agreed on the COP. I know earlier I said 29%, but this has been increased by 30% onwards. We will provide you with the statistics after this presentation if you would like, so everyone can be updated with regards to the international landscape and our current commitment in this regard. Uh, also, there is um, uh, the fact that the G20 leaders agreed to accelerate and ensure an energy transition that is sustainable, fair, affordable, and investment inclusive. There is also the Bali Compact and the Bali Energy Transition Roadmap, which were agreed upon to uh, find solutions to achieve energy market stability, transparency, and affordability. Uh, the Bali roadmap prioritizes on four, sorry, three different things, including secure energy access, increased smart and clean technology, as well as increased funding and energy. There's a lot of uh, mobility and engagement during the G20, and this is something that we should all be proud of with the fact that we were able to hold such a prestigious event, which have um, resulted in numerous, numerous um you know conclusions and we do hope that in, in in the years to come the next steps forward would be to collectively hand in and um, realizing these targets uh, together and the next slide yes this one uh, in order to lower emissions there are so many things we can do within the energy sector including incentivizes incentivizing cleaner energy sources, create special economic zones across the country to boost economic activity, consider the phasing out of coal where feasible, implementing CCUS or uh, carbon capture utilization storage technologies. This slide particularly was something that I conveyed during the 
COP27 in uh, Egypt just a while back, just a few weeks ago, um, in order to kind of give an update to the international community as to what we are looking to do uh, in the next years to come. Uh, and now, what are the relevance to, to uh, the utilization of renewable energy at Indonesian universities. I try to kind of incorporate that in this presentation. If we go to the next slide, there are several examples of universities in, in Indonesia that use solar energy um, for their electricity. Uh, for example, in Institut Teknologi Malang with uh, the solar capacity of 500 kilowatts per hour or um, 0.5 megawatt peak, sorry, kilowatts peak, not hour. <laughs> and also, secondly, Institute Technology Sumatra with solar capacity of one megawatt peak. Uh, there's also Universitas Tanjung Pura with solar capacity of 1.5 megawatt peak. Uh, there are so many different examples. If we go to the next slide, um, there are you know campuses around the world, for example, in the University of Groningen, uh, Netherlands, where there is an energy positive building which produces more than it consumes. Uh, there's a rooftop solar and solar energy um, system as well being implemented, which is really, really cool. I think aesthetically it looks pretty cool, but also uh, in terms of the energy saving is something that I feel we can all uh, follow the footsteps of. There's also the eco building at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, energy positive building, pr again, producing more than it consumes. There is uh, 1,200 rooftop solar panels being um, implemented and installed as well, which is really, really cool. And if we go to the next slide, um, if uh, we see in Universitas Indonesia, uh, as also is an example of a 40% energy saving system that they've incorporating uh, incorporated. They also have a solar energy rooftop system a system being installed. And in Universitas di Ponegoro, so your university is also uh, you know incorporating sustainable and green practices, which is something that we should all uh, be grateful for. There is a 65% energy saving mechanism currently being put in place. There is 76 solar panels that can generate up to 35.5 megawatts hour of energy. Um, and this is something that uh, hopefully other universities across the country can follow. Uh, as for the next slide, uh, where I currently work right now as a member of parliament representing the district of Gresik and Lamongan, and currently a member of Commission 7, which deals with the energy research, innovation, and industry sectors, uh, we currently have uh, optimized on solar or rooftop solar energy. Uh, so we have around 1,955 kilowatts peak, mm -hmm. and also uh, the energy park as well well, which is really just in front of, sorry, this is like at the back end of the entrance of the parliament. So just behind the Gedung Kura Kura, uh, we have the energy park, um, which uh, amounts to around 150.5 kilowatts peak. It generates more than 222,200 uh, kilowatts an hour and supplies 30.6% of the total electricity demand generally in the building. Um, it saves money as well uh, of around 2.4 billion rupiah per year so there is uh, a lot of um, strengths associated to the renewable energy sector it all just boils down to do we have the system for this do we have the obligation or really just the um intention the niat gitu ya untuk melakukan perubahan-perubahan yang pada dasarnya dibutuhkan gitu. So this is something that we're trying to push in the parliament. So my last slide is wanting to kind of just tell everybody here if we can go to the next two slides with regards to the um, what is currently happening at the Indonesian parliament. We are trying to push the new and renewable energy bill um, with the hopes that this can give a solution and give a comprehensive legal basis. Uh, we hope that this can complement the regulatory deficiencies in the previous regulations. We can build a conducive new and renewable energy ecosystem and investment uh, climate. Um, can we go to the ne next slide? I hope 
uh, there won't be a problem for that. Yeah. And also uh, the Paris Agreement as well with regards to the energy sector, we have the potential of decreasing even more um, emissions. And so Commission 7, we have uh, done our homework. Uh, we have opened the discussions to more than 20 institutions. Uh, we've talked to the academics, we've talked to the private sector, the non-governmental uh, non organizations, the intergovernmental, uh, regional government. There are so many people that we spoke to and kind of opened our doors with regards to this bill. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, <coughs> there's a lot being covered. And I'd like to highlight that this is politics. Um, everything around you is a result of a political um, process and this is something that is, is something that we have to accept uh, and it's something that we have to be aware of you know um, I think politics plays such an important and integral part of development and without having the right policies we will not be able to create the changes that we are looking to achieve for the country. And so getting the politicians to be in the, in the right frame of mind um, with the right intentions and the right goals is essential in creating the changes that we need to see in the future. The Indonesian parliament right now is very committed uh, in creating a sustainable future. Uh, we are uh, in parliament, it consists of nine political parties and we have successfully um, agreed upon the need for this transition. This again, uh, had we had to go through a very long process, but I'm very happy to announce that we are now all in the same page. And we hope that this bill can really just, um, you know, support in terms of the funding, in terms of the procedure, um, in terms of the facilities and infrastructure, human resource capacity development, technology application, uh, investment generally as well, um, and also also the monitoring process. Pangawasan, you know, maybe uh, there needs to be a, a a separate body which can not only regulate but also just monitor the implementation of renewable energy across the country. We don't have this yet because the scale of renewables right now is still relatively small um, in comparison to uh, fossil fuels. So this is what I'd like to highlight in today's discussion. Um, I do hope that you find this useful. Um, I try to kind of give you a broad economic uh, perspective, sorry, political perspective uh, as well as the policies currently in place and give you some examples of what kind of you know, how we can diversify our energy portfolio and the kinds of um, examples in which renewable energy has been optimized for universities, places of uh, studying, but also how this can also be implemented in places of work, including the Indonesian parliament. So I do hope that you find this very useful. I'm so sorry that I will not be able to stay until the end because I do have to go in the next 10 minutes. Um, but thank you very much for your time and I do hope that you found this uh, presentation useful. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Ibu Dia, for your cool presentation, crystal clear. I think I will not repeat again or summarize what you already presented and then directly uh, over to the floor here. Uh, all students have a lot of questions since the beginning. They talk about uh, us about uh, renewable energy, even the session is about economic. So I think, yes, uh, yes, one question. Any other question? Two questions? Three questions. Okay, I will limit it to three. Hopefully, Ibu Dia still have uh, time to answer their uh, curiosity and their questions. Okay, please, in the front side, Mention your name you. and maybe brief uh, questions yes. directly. Thank you. I'll make it brief. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, the host of UNDIP, thank you very much for having this international student leadership. It's a great uh, event and I'm happy to be here. I'm from Asanuddin University. I'm not a student. I'm one of the lecturers, but I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Ibu Dia. Your presentation is excellent for us. Give us really enlightenment of what uh, the commission in the... Parliament House is doing. Thank you very much. Very uh, brief question, especially on the support of electrical vehicles, uh, Ibu Dia. 
what is actually can be done for this because one of the renewable energy that we are trying to reduce the emission is by having these electric vehicles. In university, we have some research on this, but I would like to know what the parliament is doing for to push on the government of the use of these electric vehicles because it's expensive and uh, maybe uh, the push on this will help us to reduce the emission. And lastly, uh, about the provision of a uh, variety of uh, energy sources, I'm uh, wanting to comment on the microelectrical uh, power generator that we uh, need to support with the local small government, uh, small uh, people, you know, I mean, how this can be also used. Because when we use solar power, it's usually for big cities and others, but we also need to consider how this uh, local people, you know, can be also supported with the provision of electrical in the small rural villages, etc. Did this needed to be considered? Thank you. If you can comment on these thought topics, would be very much appreciated. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. I'm very much uh, impressed of your Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Ilham Pak Ruku. Thank, Thank you, Pak Ilham, for your first. questions. Uh, maybe uh, hold and then, uh, yes, the second question lady is in the middle, in the center, yes, uh, wearing glasses. Yes, please. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ayesa Ramadani Pramesti and I'm from ITS University. And also thank you for Mrs. Dia for the very insightful presentation. So I would like to ask uh, related to renewable energy. So as all we know, fossil energy is still much more affordable than renewable energy. Therefore, many people still prefer to use fossil energy instead of renewable energy. So I would like to ask, how can we change this system from your perspective? And I also have another question. My other question is, as all we know also, oil and gas are still one of the biggest commodity that is being exported to other countries. How will it affect our economy if we change our main source of energy to pure renewable energy as our main source energy? Thank you. Well, thank you. And the last for this session, uh, yes, uh, a gentleman in the middle. Yeah, wearing uh, white shirts, please. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we appreciate also on the. Uh, my question is, uh, despite the fact that uh, emissions in the air, actually what they do cause is uh, a, a respiratory related kind of uh, problem to the health. Uh, I'm wondering, when I came to Indonesia, uh, part of their social life is uh, more of smoking. It's not an insult to say. Uh, I'm wondering, despite that we are looking up to conservation of uh, energy through uh, use of solar, but at the back of the mind, you're trying to reduce uh, emission rallies or gases into the air. And the population you're trying to actually uh, prevent from inhalation of the emissions does a lot of uh, smoke as a social life. I would like clarity on the, what probably the, the representatives or the government has done to see that uh, it, ha it can protect the community it wants to serve the energy for. Thank you. Well, thank you all these three questions. Maybe uh, it's time to Ibudia to give a response or react to this to this question. Please, your time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yang pertama buat Pak Ilham ya. So the first one is for Pak Ilham, um, one of the lecturers that are, that is present here today. Thank you for the question. I think electric vehicles is one of the things that we're trying to push in Indonesia. Uh, the G20 summit has been quite pivotal in uh, proving that uh, we are able to, uh, you know, be able to kind of optimize on the electric vehicles. Uh, yes, Bali, in a sense, was a test case for this as well. In a way, we can say that this was a pilot study for uh, the potential in which we can achieve uh, going forward with regards to the optimization of electric vehicles. Uh, perhaps some of you have kind of followed up uh, with how renewable energy have been uh, kind of, uh, you know, um, optimized during the G20 summit. And I do hope that this does not stop 
at the G20 summit. This can continue for years to come in the country. Uh, you know, we've held conversations with the current governor of Bali, Pak Kostar, as well, uh, as to what kind of plans he has going forward. Because when we speak of electric vehicles, there is around 70 charging stations. Commission 7 actually had a working trip visit to Bali to kind of um, monitor the process of um, uh, a pre G20. So before the G20 summit started, we had a working visit there. We spoke to the governor as well with regards to what kind of preparations have been set forth for us to receive all of these world le leaders, um, including um, everybody in that came as well. And so one of the things that they've incorporated is that they have around 70 charging stations across the island, you can imagine. And um, this is something that I feel needs to optimize on a national level. Um, and again, it all boils down to uh, the fact that not only the transportation aspect is important, but also the act the sorry, the um, what is it called? The infrastructure aspect is also very important. You know, infrastructure in terms of the charging stations, uh, we need to make this more readily available to the public. And one of the things that we're trying to push the government through Pertamina, because Pertamina is also one of our working partners, is how can um, the existing uh, uh, gas stations uh, or SPBU can also be optimized for charging stations as well. Because right now we do have several charging stations, but they are not consistent and are not uh, necessarily um, available in all uh, in all gas stations across the country. So this is something that we can potentially push going forward in order for um, the infrastructure to be readily available as well. In terms of the pricing, again, everything is derived by demand. So uh, unfortunately, the demand for um, uh, vehicles that are not necessarily uh, powered by electricity is a lot larger. And so this uh, has a lot of impact on the price as well. But I think going forward, when we have the right regulations set forward, yeah, jadi regulasinya sudah ada, lalu kemudian, if we also have um, the infrastructure for it, then this will automatically drive the demand because the demand is very interesting. Uh, not a lot of people will want to shift if they themselves believe and feel that it will be a burden for them, right? So if they don't know or are unaware that, you know, there are charging stations available, you know, um, and they don't have that security, that sense of security that they will be okay in the streets if, for example, say they ran, ran out of uh, charging or they are in a position of needing to charge their vehicle. You know, that, that also drives demand, right? Uh, aside from that, also the competitiveness uh, in terms of the pricing, et cetera. So uh, there is a top-down approach from this as well and with regards to the need for a regulation for it, but particularly on electric vehicles, but then also how the governments uh, alongside our state-owned enterprises to work on the uh, you know, making available charging stations across the country for us to then drive demand in the future, for then uh, electric vehicles to be more competitive within the market. Because yes, we are decreasing greenhouse gas emissions when we do optimize on electric vehicles in our country, but then bear in mind that we are decreasing greenhouse gas emissions within the transportation sector. However, in the energy sector, this is also th something that we need to study, because if we still charge, um, you know, electric vehicles uh, that is still powered by fossil fuels, because that is where we are getting our electricity, then this just means that in one sense, we are decreasing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, but within the energy sector, this may potentially increase. And so our next step is also think about how these charging stations are being fueled where our electricity is coming from, uh, et cetera. So this is, again, uh, a big homework for the government, but I'm quite optimistic because the G20 summit have proven that our leaders, uh, our leader of the country as well, have made substantial progress in the kind of insights that they have going forward. And with regards to the micro renewables, uh, we do have Rencana Umum Energi Daerah. So um, policies that are being implemented at the regional level as well, in which uh, small scale renewable energy um, is hoped to be optimized. And this again 
is uh, being uh, driven, not driven, but uh, this depends on the regulation of each province. Uh, I know in Jawa Timur, uh, we do have um, uh, a lot of potential for, for example, waste energy facilities, a small scale, and this is currently being backed up and supported by the government. So this is something that hopefully can be achieved in other provinces across the country. Uh, the question from ITS, terima kasih atas pertanyaannya. I did not catch your name, I'm so sorry. But um, how can renewables be more preferred in our country? Uh, I think it all boils down to the competitiveness again. We are not competitive enough, enough in terms of the pricing. And so we do need a regulation that can regulate this. Um, we need to make sure that there is enough incentive later on the market for renewables to prosper. Uh, we do need to uh, try to integrate the, you know, the carbon taxing system that was meant to be levied on April of this year, but uh, we're currently facing a halt. And I think it's our job as well as, you know, or everyone here as students to question that, you know, why is the government um, not doing enough uh, in terms of the application or the implication application sorry of the carbon taxing system because in that way if we do incorporate the carbon taxing system then this will make renewable energy more competitive within the energy market taking into account the negative externalities associated to the fossil fuel industry this will be a huge win for the renewable sector and so my question right now even to the government and is what's taking so long, right? So that's that's one thing. And also, uh, when we speak of pure renewable energy in Indonesia alone, uh, that's very idealistic. And I would love to be in that position. But uh, we also need to be realistic. I think that's what politics have taught me is to be able to combine the uh, you know all of these targets and these ideal scenarios that I like, I'd like to see, but also realistically, whether this is possible or not. Indonesia, luckily, is a country that is very rich in resources. We are rich in the fossil fuel sector. We are rich in the renewable energy sector, even the um, new uh, energy sector as well. So we have the privilege of having a choice, right? So one of the things that we are trying to push is to transition. In order to transition, this will take time. And so I do hope that in the years to come, we are able to change our energy portfolio in which uh, a more majority, a majority can be driven by the renewable energy sector uh, and the fossil sector, even if we do optimize it, this can be um, set forth as the base load of our energy because we do not want to see what happened in uh, several countries in Europe to happen in Indonesia as well, particularly um, stemming from the crisis or the war uh, happening in Ukraine and Russia, in which there are countries in Europe who uh, have optimized renewable energy, no longer uh, you know, use coal, are now uh, going in the steps of going back to coal because of their emergency situation. And so we do not want to be in that situation. I think every country um, you know, shifts uh, or transitions in uh, several ways, and Indonesia has its way of doing so. Um, and I do hope in the future that our energy mix can be uh, led by reno the renewable energy sector because, again, this does not have a time limit, you know, um, in which the fossil fuel industry does have a expiry date. And for the last question, I'm so sorry, I'm not able to really catch the question. So yes, we do have a, probably you could say a smoking culture. I personally don't like to smoke, <laughs> but uh, I do understand that this may be the culture uh, in Indonesia, but I'm not really sure with regards to how that, um, how that uh, relates to the ap ap implementation of uh, renewable energy. But I do hope, but again, yes, uh, when we speak of air pollution and how that has detrimental impacts on our health, the same thing goes for smoking, um, also has a detrimental impact on our health. Um, there's a reason why smoking packages is very expensive in emerging and developed nations because they are trying to promote a healthier uh, lifestyle. But in Indonesia, this is very cheap. <laughs> and so in a way, uh, it, we are encouraging this kind of behavior, unfortunately. But um, this is something that I do hope can improve in future because, again, um, anything that is detrimental to our health will play 
a big role and has a massive impact on our human capital. And uh, the quality of our human capital has a detrimental impact on our economic growth in general. So I do hope that uh, answers the question, yeah, uh, moderator. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for your question, and I think it's uh, answering all the, these questions. Uh, do you mind to take up, taking up one short questions? Okay, okay. one more, yeah, Pa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, one more questions. Okay. Yes, uh, from here, the left side, please. Uh, please make it a concise and quick questions. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. My name is Firuz, Bukhara State University, Uzbekistan. Uh, Let can me ask a little you... bit uh, louder, please? Yes. Yes, yes, of course. Let me ask you a question. As far as we know, the energy production is becoming uh, popular in the world, but um, the main thing is that the sustainable energy production is affordable. Uh, for all societies, uh, unfortunately, today there is a problem in the world that uh, energy production uh, is expected to, to be, to Europe is expected to experience energy crisis in the upcoming winter. So, my question is that, do you think sustainable, sustainable energy production, such as uh, energy taken from wind energy or solar energy can supply in recent years. For example, uh, because of the war that is uh, taking place between Russia and Ukraine, Europe is, uh, experience, is expected to experience uh, a huge uh, energy they will need. So, uh, how many years does it take from our scientists uh, or uh, from the whole world to replace the sustainable energy uh, or to replace the current uh, expensive energy with sustainable energy. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, Ibudia? so if okay. bisa langsung get, Pak, ya? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, from Virus from Uzbekistan. Thank you for your question and I'm yet to visit your country and I do hope that I can in the future. Uh, so thank you for the question. Yes, uh, I think a lot of the countries in Europe right now who are optimizing on renewable energy are currently facing a uh, difficult time because um, in terms of the, you know, the, the demand for, for example, heating, uh, especially in the winter time, um, has been kind of uh, put on a halt uh, with regards to the impact of the war currently taking place. Uh, but all in all, when we speak of the renewable energy and how this can be optimized uh, in the years to come, again, it boils down to uh, every country is different. So I cannot necessarily generalize, for example, what is being experienced in Europe to be the same exact case for Indonesia alone. Right now, anyway, what we're trying to optimize in is because we do have a richness in resources of all all uh, types of energy so one of the ways in which we're trying to do this is we're still we're still utilizing fossil fuel but we are now um, taking small steps uh, hopefully fast enough for transitioning and for us to then optimize on renewable energy given our immense um, potential for this but other countries in europe not all, for example, may have the same kind of energy portfolio as uh, Indonesia, for example. Like, I think, uh, where was it? Was it Denmark? I think, I think it was Denmark, if I'm not mistaken. We studied about their kind of um, process of transitioning, and it did take quite a while. It took them more than 30 years, actually, from the, the use of fossil fuels, in which actually they imported. 
um, I'm not sure from which country, but they did import fossil fuels for their electricity ge generation. But I do get the feeling that they are trying to be independent in terms of their energy supply. And so they've decided to optimize on offshore wind energy. And so uh, through a very long, lengthy political process, they were able to rummage through um, and establish a energy portfolio that is predominantly based on um, a fossil, uh, sorry, predominantly based on renewable energy. And this works out better for their economy. This works out better for their sovereignty. Um, and right now, uh, with even though the war is happening, um, and even though that does have immense impact on countries across the world, but they are still able to sustain themselves. Right. And so, again, every country is facing uh, different situations and scenarios. Um, and yes, the current crisis is having a toll on the current oil and gas prices, for example. So, yes, there is a international impact uh, in which is also being experienced in Indonesia. But again, every country is different in terms of their energy uh, portfolio. Indonesia, I do hope personally that we can shift and we can transition as fast as possible um, because that way we can then optimize on our uh, renewable energy uh, potential as well. So I do hope that that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for your uh, clear uh, answer, uh, Ibu Dia. And although there are many rising hands here, but I do believe that uh, we have to move forward to the next uh, session and uh, we are in the end of the session. Please join me together uh, to applaud Ibu Dia for the nice contributions to our meeting. Thank you so much, Ibu Dia. Back to Thank the... Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Uh, back to the MC, please. Thank you very much, Bapak Ruku, and also Ibu Diaroro, for the time in sharing your expertise with us. What a very dynamic, fruitful session that we have before. Okay, we still have another amazing keynote speaker joining us online. She will speak about networking as a tool for sustainable universities implementation. Please welcome Regional Focal Point Asia Pacific of Sustainable Development Solutions Network Youth, Ms. Sitara Kumbale. Good morning, Ms. Sitara Kumbale. Hi, good morning. Hello, good morning. Okay. And to guide the delivery of the keynote speech and discussion, kindly being invited to the front as the moderator, Ibu Desi Arianti, STMT, PhD. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the MC. So, uh, good morning to the Honorable Universitas Diponegoro leaders and also invited guests, uh, the representative of UI Green Metric and also the Sustainable Development Solutions Network (SDS) in Indonesia, distinguished keynote speakers, and all the participants, student leader from over 45 universities and also 14 countries. Uh, we also have participants that are joining us uh, virtually today via Zoom and also YouTube platform. So welcome to Indonesia, welcome to Semarang, and also welcome to Universitas Diponegoro. It's really uh, such a pleasure and honor to be with you today here and experience new things. And also we believe that this will be a part of your journey to become leaders in the community for the SDGs achievement. Uh, my name is Desi Arianti. I'm the Secretary of SDG Center, Mr. Stiponogoro, and I will be in charge for the sessions that will discuss about the networking as a tool for sustainable universities implementations and how the networking as well as partnerships can accelerate the SDGs achievement. 
So before I introduce you deeply to the, our keynote speakers today, uh, I would like to start with some introductions. Collaboration uh, across sectors has appeared as one of the keywords for the international developments uh, in the 21st century, and networking, as well as partnership, has grown to become an essential paradigm in the sustainable development. The fundamental base of good networking and partnership is their ability to bring together diverse resources in the way that it can together achieve more, more impact, greater sustainability, increase value to all. Each part of the society, such as universities, communities, private sectors, governments, NGO, and others, have crucial role as a development actors and the networking collaborations and cooperations among them will create synergy to accelerate the SDGs target achievement. However, till date, networking and partnership are still not mainstream approach. And there is an insufficient enabling system that can systematically develop networking and partnership in the scale that is required to deliver the implementations of SDGs. So uh, that's why we bring our next keynote speakers today. Uh, Ms. Sitara Kumbale, uh, she's the SDSN Youth Regional Focal Point Asia Pacific. So if you search on the Google, so SDSN Network or SDSN Youth is one of the world's biggest network for young leaders working together to accelerate solutions toward the sustainable development goals. It connects young people to pathways of understanding and actions to shape a sustainable world for the future generations. I think Sitara will be the right person to deliver on how networking can generate a significant added value to deliver a greater impact of the implementations of SDG through student and also university. Uh, Sitara Kumbale now is joining us through online platform due to a tight schedule, but uh, I believe it will not reducing the amount of uh, knowledge that we, she will bring on us today. So uh, I will give a brief introduction to Sitara. Sitara holds a Bachelor of Technology Engineering from National Institute Technology Karnataka Surankal and also Master of Applied Science in Data Economics and Development Policy, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She has experience in Wells Fargo as a research assistant in United Nations Development Programs and many more. So without further ado, please welcome Sitara. Hi, good morning. I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you so much for introducing me, Dasi. It's so nice to be here with you today. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to be speaking at this event. Um, I've just, you know, I just caught a little bit the last part of the speech from the previous speaker, and it was so engaging and so exciting to listen um, to, you know, the renewable energy developments in Indonesia. And yeah, it was, I, I think it was like really exciting to listen in and um, see what progress is being made there. So I'm going to be touching upon topics of networking and the role the youth has in achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, I'm just going to wait till we have my slides up. There we go, almost like that. Awesome. So um, I'm going to be talking specifically about leveraging youth networks and, um, you know, youth networks within universities, youth networks within um, communities, whatever youth networks you are the most familiar with and you are the most involved in to really achieve and like push the SDG talk to the forefront. Um, this is something we're going to be touching upon today. We have a small activity in the end, which I'm really looking forward to. I hope all of you enjoy it as well. Um, if we can switch to the next slide. Okay, I just put in a brief um, introduction about myself. I'm the regional focal point for um, 
SES and youth within the Asia Pacific region. Um, I worked in international development consulting, and I have a background in economics, in development, and in engineering. Um, I've worked with the UNDP, and I've also worked with some NGOs across Asia and Africa. Um, my SDG experiences are in SDG 1, 4, 5, 10, 13, and 17. Um, within the SDSN youth spectrum, I work specifically very, very focused on partnerships for the goals, which is why I'm here delivering uh, this talk about networking. Um, I'm going to start with giving you a brief about what we do at SDS and youth, what our objectives are, why we believe that youth as a whole are kind of the future in um, really pushing for these SDGs. And then we're, I'm going to take you through um, some of the work we've done at SDS and youth um, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, followed by that, we have a small activity, which I hope you all are going to enjoy participating in. So we can just switch to the next slide. Right. So SDS and youth, uh, what we believe is that youth and the young leaders really hold the potential to accelerate um, the, you know, the SDGs and like really achievement towards the SDGs. And we believe that networking and uh, connecting young people to these pathways of success and like really enabling them with the tools that they would need um, to succeed is kind of the way to go. Um, we believe that young people are the brightest, the smartest, uh, the most capable, the most critical thinkers, the leaders, and really the people who hold the key to achieving the SDGs and not just the SDGs to really like making sure that we have a very sustainable future for set out for us. Um, we're a global network. We're spread across the world. Um, uh, the SES and youth was founded by Professor Jeffrey Sachs um, a while ago. <laughs> um, I think we've been around for quite a few years now. But yeah, it, it was founded by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Um, uh, it was kind of founded in collaboration with SES and networks, which are research networks across the world. Uh, but this was, uh, you know, founded to really, I would say, bring the voice of the youth to the forefront and really kind of encourage that cross collaborative networking between people who are building policy, people who are researching policy within the university space um, and, you know, kind of bringing youth voices to that so that um, youth have a larger say in, um, you know, in, in just... Um, really shaping policy and really like encouraging the um, implementation of the SDGs within the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, it, if we can switch to the next slide, uh, I'm going to be talking through, uh, you know, why we believe youth are the future. Just as we do that, just as we go to the next slide, um, I think um, I'd just like to talk through some of like our key, um, our key like objectives. Um, we, I think, our objective of SDS and youth is pretty much kind of centered around um, youth itself and really like elevating youth to a position where they are empowered to achieve the SDGs, where they're empowered to make connections, where they're empowered to network within their communities and even outside their communities to um, achieve these SDGs. We think the youth are the future for these six, region, six reasons. Um, one, and I think you're all really, really aware of this, the youth are the most susceptible to the actions of climate change, to the actions of you know, not achieving the SDGs, to um, increasing food security, the youth are the most susceptible, they're one of the most vulnerable communities. Uh, because of this, the youth are in a position to um, really, like, I would say, uh, push the SDGs to the forefront. We believe that the youth are the leaders, they have the knowledge, they have the rights, and uh, they can be empowered and equipped 
scope to like drive change. As you can see, um, within like countries and communities, we've had so many youth leaders um, around the world really pushing uh, so many different agendas, so many different SDG agendas to the forefront. Um, we've had recently COP27, the climate conference took place and it had more youth activists than it has ever seen before. Uh, so we really do believe youth are the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, we also believe youth have the ability to really like, you know, identify challenges and like really question power structures that already exist and um, and like move beyond these structures to to like brainstorm solutions to um, work on like critical thinking. And we believe that, um, you know, this critical thinking ability of the youth is really, uh, I would say, enhanced um, at universities by like the additional knowledge that they receive um, from from these universities, which is why we partner so heavily with universities, and which is why we're housed within the SDSA network, which is a network of universities. Um, we believe that the youth are innovators, they understand the problems, um, that are present and have the ability to really brainstorm and bring up solutions to these problems. The youth are effective communicators because they can like build the bridge between, you know, people within their community and the larger policy making space. And they have this uh, ability to bring policy voices and policy objectives and and maybe even their community's problems and their community's uh, priorities to the policy space. So youth, we believe, have that ability to be that bridge. And I think the most important of all is that the youth are change makers. The youth have always been change makers. They have the power to act, they have the power to mobilize. And um, the ability to, I would say, stay ahead of times, to um, bring their networking prowess to the forefront. And this is because connectivity is greater than ever. As you can see, you all are gathered there, sitting in a hall, you know, and but we also have some people virtually with us over Zoom. We have like amazing connectivity. We have so many, so many people, you know, connected throughout the world. And really this power that the youth and, you know, the networking structures around them, the universities for us is something amazing. Um, Let's move forward. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a brief about some of the work we've done in the Asia Pacific region, which is the region I specifically lead and support. Uh, we have seven networks in total. We have uh, we have what we call regional networks and national networks. Regional networks are more a congregation of countries and national networks are specifically, you know, focused on one country. Um, we have national networks in Korea, in Kazakhstan. We have one in Indonesia, which is how I am here today. Um, we have one in the Philippines and one in Hong Kong. As for regional networks, we have one in South Asia, which uh, covers a few countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Bangladesh. Um, I've repeated Bangladesh, apologies. <laughs> uh, we also have um, a regional network um, in the Australia region. Um, so it covers the countries of Australia, New Zealand, and all the Pacific Islands, the Solomon Islands, Fiji. Um, we've engaged closely with some of these. But yeah, um, we, we've, we have around 26 countries in total involved across the region. Uh, but we have seven networks in total. This is just a little bit of, I would say, an overview of, you know, our um, footprint throughout the region. Um, our, one of our oldest networks is the Philippines network and Indonesia network as well. Um, some of our new, Kazakhstan is our newest network. They just started this year. Um, but yeah, we've been like, I would say, steadily expanding our footprint throughout the region, um, really trying to engage more and more countries and more and more universities in this conversation of, um, you know, having the youth at the forefront as well, trying to like, um, trying to really like empower the youth and engage the youth in this conversation and encourage them to, to like put, put themselves and their priorities at the forefront um, of SDG development. 
Um, so if we move to the next slide, we're uh, just going to be taking a deep dive into some of the impacts we've had in the Asia Pacific. And this is where I'm specific specifically going to be touching upon the role that networking and our cross regional network within, you know, this entire whole spectrum that I just showed you, this cross regional network that we have has really like pushed the SDG agenda to the forefront. Um, one of the events we had just recently um, is was really was like a was a side event of COP27, um, also really really related to uh, Global Climate Change Week. Um, all of our networks across the region, uh, we collaborated to to kind of really bring as you as you know the voice Asia Pacific is uh, a very disaster prone region. We've had so many flash floods. We've had so many earthquakes. I, I think Indonesia recently experienced an earthquake as well. We've had so many disastrous kind of scenarios. Um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia is being like, like you know, steadily it's being bleached. It's like um, kind of uh, what's the word for it? It's it's like you know slowly deteriorating. There's a lot of coral deterioration even in Indonesia. But yeah, as you see, it's very, very, very disaster prone region. Um, it's also research has also proven that the youth are the most susceptible to this disaster within the region. Um, and also that the youth voices are not heard um, in climate discussions in the region. So it's something that the networks across the region wanted to remedy. And uh, what they did was they kind of, I would say, built this cross collaborative event between the universities across the region to um, to engage with the youth from these universities. Um, so what we did was we, you know, sent out invites to universities to send youth representatives from the universities, um, really built like this network from, and we had people from around 13 countries to work to build, brought them together to really work together and outline their priorities for what they believe the Asia Pacific region as a whole should focus on, um, should like really prioritize in terms in in like COP27. Um, we also had some COP delegates coming in, people who were who had gone to COP previously, as well as people who had uh, who were set to go to COP this year. Um, we had them coming in and talking about their COP experiences. Um, this. I would say 13 country network of university students uh, brought out these four priorities. Uh, one of it was really centralizing marginalized voices, which was um, really bringing voices of youth, voices of women, voices of like um, native communities that often get marginalized to the forefront. Uh, the second one was about climate education. Uh, youth of the region really wanted better climate education they wanted to um, see they wanted to see more climate education integrated in universities um, they wanted more policies around climate education uh, immediate decarbonization this is very interesting because uh, previous speaker also spoke about uh, fossil fuels versus renewable energy but one of the priorities the youth really highlighted um, from across the universities was that they wanted um, policymakers in the region to prioritize decarbonization. And the last one, which I think is a very, very, very relevant in the developing world context, is um, global north-south equity. Um, the youth really believed that, you know, within the region, we have a lot of developing countries, and um, almost all of us are developing countries. And, you know, they really believe that the developing the developed countries should somehow compensate for some of the emissions that uh, have previously been, you know, uh, have, have pre previously been in the atmosphere throughout the years, throughout their development. So they did believe that the global north and the developed world should take some of that um, load. Uh, now I'm going to be highlighting some of our some of our works, of specific networks, um, and some of, I would say, the broad SDG focus that it's covered, um, and really like how networking and how universities have played into that um, that larger um, larger project management 
thing. So yeah, so um, we I, I'm highlighting this project by SDS and Youth um, Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific, which is a regional network. Um, so what they've been doing is they're conducting a research at the moment to uh, talk about what what affects the youth in the region in terms of like how aware they are of the SDGs and also um, how the region is progressing in implementing the SDGs that um, the youth are most you know, concerned about. So um, the method and the data analysis framework itself that they're creating, they want to be able to reuse it. And they also want to be able to write a policy report that can be circulated um, within the policy makers uh, of the region. The framework that they're building is being closely supported by Monash University, which is their host university. And um, they've kind of engaged in this three-step process. The first has been with has been like engaging with university students across the region and just universities in general. Um, they've uh, I think engaged with around 35 universities in um, Australia and New Zealand, and I think around 10 in the Pacific. Um, really building this like network of universities that they're taking consultations and inputs from in uh, in you know understanding the SDG priorities of the region they're using further data analysis and a framework that's being built by monash university in collaboration with sds and youth to like measure progress towards these specific targets that the youth have outlined to be their priorities and what and They've so right now they're working on step two, but step three, which is the next step that they want to do, is write together, write pull all of these insights together into kind of a report so that uh, this can be disseminated throughout um, the policymakers and to really like shape policy in the region. Um, the next one I'm going to be talking about is some of the work that was done by SES and Youth Hong Kong. Um, as they worked very, very closely with the Chinese University of Hong Kong to deliver a workshop to, um, to school children. The workshop specifically focused on SDG 12. And um, I, I feel like school children and like people in school often get ignored within the youth spectrum, though they are a very, very important part of it. Um, they really hold, I would say, shaping them at a young age is really important. And it's something that, um, this workshop specifically focused on which was using innovation um, to really reduce the use of plastic um, and it, it was started at a very basic level it was started with introducing the school children itself to the ideas of the sdgs and sdg education and really sdg brainstorming plays such a big role in um, upskilling and universities play a big role here too because um you know they have this potential to like shape the understanding of the SDGs. And that's what um, this design thinking workshop was about, brainstorming solutions and shaping the understanding of the SDGs. They also had a very specific COP27 series. So one um, thing about the network here, they have a very strong history of sending uh, delegates to COP and really like focusing on climate action. So they worked specifically with an NGO to do two things. One was to upskill the youth who would be attending COP in communications in specific climate change advocacy to really like um, advocate for their priorities, to advocate for Hong Kong youth priorities, and also to bring the voice of the youth to the forefront. So it was like kind of a dual capacity building workshop that they conducted. And it was to really like understand how youth can be loud in communicating their priorities and communicating um, what they believe, you know, should be achieved, what policy, what they believe policymakers should be achieving. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so we're also, we're also, I'm also going to be talking through um, some work that we did that. SES and Youth South Asia did um, specifically on and on the environment and sustainability education. So they partnered with um, the Energy and Resources Institute, which is a leading uh, institute that works to um, that that works specifically in the energy sector and uh, resources on resources. So they worked to kind of I would say um, start kickstart this like 
environmental consciousness and awareness campaign among school children. And they did this by uh, rolling out an OMPR with um, a specific and very interesting prize. Um, they, uh, as you know, like the awareness ar around sustainability and sustainability education is not very strong um, in the school children space. So they wanted it to be interactive and they also wanted it to be um, to, to really help the school children raise awareness about like what the SDGs were. So they had like this, this like Olympiad with like, you know, fun treats and um, the winners of the Olympiad were given like free ride tickets to uh, the World Sustainable Development Summit, which is set to happen next year. Uh, but yeah, the, the Olympiad focused specifically on like enabling climate and like environmental consciousness among school children and really about like, you know, um, how sustainable development really shapes and really like uh, would would really have an impact on their lives. And it also, they also had like a special workshop before it to talk about the SDGs, uh, to talk about how uh, the environment and environment specific SDGs um, have an impact in the region. Um, and yeah, they, it was held in collaboration with the university, which is the Energy and Resources Institute, uh, really kind of, you know, building and bridging those networks that we have within the university space and the youth space to ensure that the youth are having the most up-to-date research, that they're engaged with like the university partners that, you know, we engage so closely with within the SDS and youth spectrum. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Thank you. So um, we have now we have I think a really really interesting case study of some of the work that we did at in SDS in Youth Korea, um, and I think this is more tied to uh, the work that this is more tied to like SDG implementation rather than SDG research, which is so different from some of the previous like works I took you through. Um, what Korea has is they've like broken down the national SDGs into what they call local SDGs to kind of like track, um, you know, local implementation of the SDGs. So they partnered with the university, the Seoul Institute, uh, but they, they partnered with the university to kind of like um, understand and study the tracking of this like local SDGs within the region and uh, within like their specific uh, city or store and what they did was they they kind of like put together a forum with with like member organizations so it was more like understanding what the implementation of the SDGs was like in the region and they put together this like panel of member organizations and they like really tried to talk to them about what their priorities were and what they thought was like um you know the roadmap to the SDG implementation and they compiled a really long report, but I think the cherry on top of the gate here was they presented it to the mayor of Seoul, and um, and I mean there were some pretty interesting next like steps that came out of it. They had like public meetings with youth leaders, and what I think is the most amazing uh, result was that uh, there was actually a consortium that was formed to to track the progress of these SDGs over time and kind of these SDG implementation over time and and really like that network and that networking of the 44 youth organizations was uh, and the 17 youth leaders who led this that was the key to like building out this um, super accountable uh, framework within the Seoul city so that you know the mayor and the political organizations in this space were kept accountable in and really like uh, empowering and and you know achieving these SDGs and uh, this report came out in 2020 and most recently the update um, I've heard from them is that you know they, they've also engaged with the Ministry of Environment to specifically focus on environmental SDGs in the region um, and to uh, you know they, they're also thinking about forming a similar kind of like network um, as they have for as local SDGs in Seoul for specifically the end for tracking the environmental SDGs. Um, some of the insights that came out through the report was that they, you know, the local SDGs, they wanted it 
they wanted society to be more inclusive they wanted to like eliminate discrimination they wanted more they wanted a fairer economy and they wanted more accountability from their policy makers and on like you know just implementation and like some of the policies that were being rolled out and that really that both that need for accountability as well as that um strong i would say network within the region is what built out this accountability consortium that they have now that really tracks the implementation of local sdgs um let's move to the next slide we can we can move to the next slide thank you yes awesome um so some of the other um wins i would say and milestones we've had this year um we've had networks work cross regionally which i think is really really interesting now because um we also have we, we've had networks work cross regionally for like better uh, you know sdg kind of uh, education and uh, sdg partnership we um we've ha we had uh, scs in hong kong and you know australia new zealand pacific work together to roll out sdg workshops which which focused on um better like oh, sdg awareness and better education in the universities the speakers were actually uh professors within like specific universities in the region and they spoke about how uh networking and how you know sdg education can be used as a tool to empower youth in the region uh we also had a series of talks from key kind of like sdg academics of the region every every like a uh, month we had a different um academic in a different region speaking about some sdg priorities um this happened throughout the region so all the networks throughout the region kind of collaborated to really roll out this event um we had um really really unique perspectives and really really unique topics that came out we had everything from energy access to health to uh cop to climate action to uh i think we even had a topic specifically on education and promoting sdg education within the region um i think the most interesting part of this specific like series was that um both of them actually was rolled out in close collaboration with universities um as is our mandate um we kind of worked to bring to bring to the forefront sdg academics from the region people who really had the experience so that the youth could be upskilled when they when they when the youth has specific priorities but maybe not always the best awareness uh, or maybe not always the best information so we really wanted to upskill the youth of the region to have the best information and to really like be aware of you know the sdg um work that's going on in the region in terms of research in terms of policy in terms of just academia and this is why we collaborated with universities for both these specific events um so yeah that's some of the work that we've done throughout the region so now we're actually i think starting to move into the activity um if we can switch to the next slide um yeah so we're going to be moving into the activity i really hope you guys have like a pen or a paper or um even if you don't you have like a mobile phone that would be um uh, ideal but yeah we can move and we can get started and maybe take like a few minutes to get a hold of a pen or a paper or like you know just a note notes application on your mobile phone any of it is great okay so what we're going to do is each of these activities i want you to take take around 5 minutes to do it's going to be a rapid brainstorming this is something that we do very often at sds and youth um and i'm going to after you're done with this i'm going to take tell you um why we do this um first i want you to sit down and identify three specific kind of pain points three problems that you think are pressing for your region i want this to be as local as possible as really boiled down to your communities your countries your regions um as an example i'm from india um i've been i've i've been brought, i've been brought up in india for a very very long time um and specifically in my community in the part of that part of india that i live in i know that flooding when um when it rains is a big problem um i want you to get as local and as specific as that um so yeah uh 
take take a few minutes to identify three specific pain points from there i want you to narrow it down to one particular kind of pain point that you think is the most easy to address um or maybe something that you are particularly passionate about and from there i want you to move to um thinking about how you would do this if you could write a letter if you were the president of your country or if you had the power to like you know implement this solution how would you do it and it can be very large scale it can be very small scale um it can be literally anything from i would shape policy to um implement this solution all the way to oh i would i would like leverage my community to like um to like work towards this problem so yeah i'm going to just spend a few minutes uh going on mute and i want you guys to really like just write this down and um i'm going to follow this up and tell you why i want you to write this down but it's um it's like i i'm going to just give you 5 minutes to do this today but but yeah let's let's take 5 minutes and i go on mute and we do this now and i will also do it with you yeah i think the audience is here would like to do the things that you recommend to do yeah braining a uh, brainstorming exercise yeah so start with the uh pain point of identification so finding problems surrounding yeah so if you look at the problems and we see what kind of things that it might be problems in your community right sitara and then after yeah. that you do narrow it down into one problem statement yeah you can do that as well it's just as per your experience it's just it's just took like 5 minutes yeah <laughs> Five minutes to do it. Yeah, huh? and it, it has to be rapid, right? Like you just think about very rapidly what you would identify as problems, mm -hmm. and um, I'm shortly going to tell you why we do this exercise and why we. So we we do it very often in our meetings, and I'm going to tell you why we do this uh, right after you're done. So we just spend the next four minutes doing it. Yeah. Um, We would like to have exciting, yeah it. the active participations yeah from the audience here yeah to do the brainstorming exercises yeah I believe we will have so many inputs uh, today yeah problems and also we trying together to solve uh, the problems that you identify exactly exactly and I think um, you know just honestly going back to my point of of like networking and like um you know brainstorming for solutions together mm -hmm. i think so this I, i'm just going to tell you guys now one of the reasons we do this is because um so many of the problems and so many of the solutions that come up throughout um throughout i would say different communities and different people are often so similar and it really helps bridge that divide i would say between communities between cultures between um between different kind of people yeah, and exactly. it really helps you work together so many people identify similar problems mm -hmm. uh, within their communities and it really helps you realize how so much of the world is grappling with the same challenges yeah. and it really helps you brainstorm together which is why we always do this exercise mm -hmm. so i would really encourage you to do it and in your next break just maybe you know talk to the people next to you talk to the people around you people from different regions yeah. and ask them what they thought the problems were what they thought the specific pain points were within their community and how they would like seek to really mitigate these pain points and i think that's kind of how you build your network that's how you talk about that's that's a first step in uh networking for the sdgs and yeah i would really encourage you guys to do it um if not now if we're mm -hmm. fast for time if not now yeah. later as well um Yeah, cool. Cuz uh, yeah, discuss it, talk yeah. about it. Talk uh -huh. about what you identified as um, a pain point yeah. within like Cuz I think Uh-huh. Sorry. After this we will have like after lunch we will do have uh, some FGD forum group discussions. I think this is like a uh, a best uh, what they call it uh, creations that we can do, yeah. Exercise that we can do after. Thank you Sitara for your presentations. Give a big applause for Sitara Kumbali. So now I uh, would like to invite the audience students here to you know ask some questions maybe you can raise your hands and uh, you can ask questions to Sitara I think we you will have a lot of questions related to the SDSN network 
uh, SDS and youth in particular, because I think those are the uh, associations or a network that you, all of you as a student's leader can actually uh, utilize, yeah, in order to bring more impact to the society. Any questions? One, two, three. Yeah, I have two questions from the first and second row of this round tables. Does, does, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Right. Um, hi, my name is Zarif Ilyasa. I'm from Malaysia. All right, so um, as we know now, nowadays, youths are more self-aware about um, things that are on social media. So in your opinion, how, actually, how to, empower, to encourage youth to empower youth? Because right now, I think they're more, um, more determined to like, uh, you know, for our followers, likes, um, and being viral and all. So um, how actually, how youth can empower youth, encourage youth? So that's my question. Yeah, thank you for the first questions from uh, your name, please. Um, oh, sorry, um, Zarif. 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 Yeah, yeah, Zarif from Malaysia. Uh, I'm holding it now. Maybe the second questions. Okay. Check. Okay. Thank you very much, the moderator, for the opportunity. And also, I want to address uh, my thanks to Yundip for hosting this great event. I hope after this, we can also collaborate. Mm -hmm. Then maybe I will address some um, question to Miss Sitara. Sitara Kumbale. Okay, yeah. I, I see that your program for SDS and it's very good. You address uh, more networking opportunity around the world, around the country. But one thing that being my concern is we assume when we doing some event, uh, let's say Indonesia with Australia, Indonesia with SDS, and we assume that the person who speaking is represent all the country, but it's I think it's not it's not proper enough if that person is represent the country. Uh, let me give you example. Let's say in Indonesia, in Indonesia we are a diverse community. Sometimes, let me, uh, I'm standing here. Maybe I'm not well representing all my country. And if we talk about this context, I think maybe the person who represent is the person who lucky who get the well iteration, the person who get uh, the right facility. But how about the rural youth? How about the rural youth that maybe we are not, haven't given them the opportunity to speak? The one thing that I want to address here to Miss Sitare Kumbala is, is the SDSN is, uh, has an, a particular issue to reach the rural community, the one who doesn't have an access to internet. Because I think it's very possible that their voice is not well represented because of they didn't have any access and channel to that. Maybe that's from me and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, sorry, your name and where are you from? Jadid from Indonesia. Jadid from Indonesia, yeah. Thank you for your question. So two questions, Sitara. The first one is how uh, from uh, Malaysia, yeah. How to encourage youth to empower youth, yeah, in this millennial uh, era, yeah. And the second question is from Jadid from uh, Indonesia. How to actually expand the access, yeah, uh, into the rural community so that everyone, every youth, yeah, can speak up their voices, yeah, through your network, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions. And I think both of them are really relevant and really important questions as well. Um, I think I'll take the first question first, which is Zari from Malaysia. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think you specifically asked about uh, how youth can empower youth in the current climate, you know, with the um, onset of social media. And like you said, there's a lot of like focus on viral videos and like viral content. And I think what what um, we've like really tried to do at STS and youth is kind of leverage that social media access itself. Um, for example, a TikTok, a TikTok video, a TikTok, like a five second TikTok, 
content can be used to spread awareness of, about SDGs. Uh, when our like, when our uh, people were at COP, when like people within our network were at COP, we held Instagram lives to really reach out to the youth, show them like what COP was like. And we had, we had like people from different countries within the region hosting these Instagram lives. So my answer to your question is really like um, to you, for youth that have access to social media and who want to be on social media to leverage as like the youth who are maybe uh, more concerned about the SDGs or who want to spread more uh, awareness about the SDGs to like leverage that social media to spread awareness amongst the youth itself. Uh, that's one of the channels, of course, and I think you spoke specifically about that. But other things um, we really do is not just, you know, using social media as a medium, but also like engaging with youth in person. Um, engaging not just with youth on the ground, but also kind of youth communities um, and uh, support structures around youth. This can be universities, this can be like member organizations that work with youth. And this can also be um, as simple as like um, policymakers that specifically focus on youth or even young policymakers. Uh, but yeah, it's not to answer your question specifically on social media is to leverage that social media to spread SDG awareness. And going back to my example of like, you know, during COP, how we had Instagram lives. Um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. I would love to take a follow up if you do have it, but I would like to answer the second question from Jadid. Um, thank you for that question. And I think um, when, I, I think it's a very important thing that you brought up, Jadid, um, you know, the, the rural youth and missed opportunity in terms of like lack of access itself that these youth may not, um, really be really be have access to communication channels or even like forums where they can express their voices uh what we've been doing of late has been to like have on the ground events um and this was really put i would say on hold because of COVID. but since like you know the pandemic's been slowing down a little bit we've been pushing more and more to have like these on the ground events where we can actually go to rural communities or more so less so me but more so like um on the ground volunteers or on the ground local sdg partners would go to like these communities and engage with like specific youth we've also started to work more and more with like member organizations and ngos that work with rural youth um that work with all kinds of youth um whether that's like school children whether that's rural school children whether that's more rural youth um yeah, so it's to like bring these voices to the forefront. I think we're using like different channels, whether that's us engaging directly or us engaging through NGOs and other member organizations. And um, I think, you know, you did highlight that as I would say one of the key uh, pain points. I think that's one of the key pain points we're trying to address at SDS and youth as well, to really make sure that all youth have their voices heard and all youth have like opportunity in conveying what um, they want to convey. So yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I mean, uh, I think that's definitely something you should discuss with some of the other delegates that have attended today and um, see if there are better solutions than the one I just mentioned. Yeah, thank you, Sitara, for your answers. I, I hope it uh, answering the questions yeah, from Jadid and also from uh, friends from Malaysia. So uh, due to the time, so I think I will conclude our discussions today. Um, it's time for the student leader to take actions, yeah, analyzing the problems and finding solutions through research and also networking. Yeah, I think that's really important as what we conduct today. And I hope those will be brings like 10 to 100 folds of impact to the society. Yeah? Thank you, Sitara. And once again, please give big applause to Sitara Kumbali. Yeah, and maybe uh, my time is up. Uh, there will be next sessions that will be led by the MC. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, back to you, Dasi. Yeah, thank you, Sitara.
Uh, sorry, I hope you guys uh, not bored to see me in here again one more time because uh, we do have one more keynote speakers that will speak today um, physically will be present here yeah so we will invite um, our vice rector for research innovations and collaborations professor Ambarianto that will talk about how we become a sustainable students. Uh, please welcome Prof. Ambarianto. Uh, so maybe the committee can try to bring the slides of Professor Ambarianto. So he will give a talk about the how we become a sustainable uh, leaders, leadership in the higher education. Yeah, uh, Professor Ambarianto has a very well uh, publications and also um, a lot of uh, experiences. Yeah, in uh, having the um, sustainability movement and sustainability initiative within the university. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Ambarianto to uh, give a talk in here. If you see uh, in here, I'm sorry, Prof, I can like speak like this. So um, Prof Ambar uh, holds a degree in the Department of, from Department of Fisheries, um, undergraduate programs, and then he did masters in the ocean science from University of South Wales and also PhD in marine ecology from the University of Sydney. Um, he also awarded as a world top 100 agriculture and forestry science on 2022. Um, and also it has a lot of uh, experience in doing research related to the sustainability. So without further ado, I will just give the mic to Professor Ampariento. Thank you very much, Bu Desi, for generous introduction. Masih belum keluar, belum. Oh, sudah, 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 itu sudah kelihatan. Lihat. Iya, ini sudah. Oke, itu aja. Again, thank you very much, Bu Desi, for uh, the introduction. As you can see on the slide, my name is Ambarianto, only one single word. It is very common in Indonesia to have one single word as a name. Yeah. Although sometimes I got difficulties when I go abroad. So, I have two kids. I give them... Not only one, not only two, but three names. <laughs> okay, uh, today I'm going to talk about sustainability leaders in higher education institution. Next. On the outline, the first one, I'm going to talk about complexity of higher education institution, and then uh, sustainability leaders, and then development of sustainable leaders in higher education institution. Next. Okay, the first one, next. As higher education institution at least we have three main aspects that influence uh, how we manage the higher education institution my experience to become a member of uh, management of uh, universities at least we are talking about human resource for example we have to think about students even parents and employer academics uh, administrative staff and so on and the second one we have to also think about infrastructure and environment for example we have to think about classrooms we have to provide laboratories 
library, stadium even, hospital even, if you can. And then the last one is teaching and learning processes. Uh, courses and then uh, practical work, faculty, school, department, study program and so on. We have to think uh, about that too. So with three aspects, it's already complicated uh, when you are managing in the higher education institutions like universities. Next. Not only three aspects actually, there are another factors which influence uh, how we manage universities. For, for example, we have to think about welfare, health and comfort, for example, for students and for academics. We are also influenced by social and political uh, changes in, in the country, for example. And then government ministry regulations, uh, before, slide before this, please. And then we also have to think about accreditation, uh, and then ranking, cluster, and so on. Next. Uh, yes, uh, the development of university, uh, the first universities uh, established usually become teaching university. And then they try to become research university, and then there is also world class university. Entrepreneur, and right now I think it's very common to discuss about sustainability, sustainable universities. Next. We are, we actually conducted surveys on why students choosing Diponegoro University as their place to study. And those are the result. Uh, high rank and high cluster has become one of their, uh, what is it, uh, reason to choose the Ponegoro University. Successful alumni as, uh, as well. And then how clean the campus is, how comfortable, healthy, even secure, and facilities available in the university. Those are uh, actually close to sustainable university actually. Next. In regard to definition of sustainability campus, there are many definitions. I took three of them. The first one is uh, uh, stressing on developing a culture of sustainability and stewardship of national resources, natural resources. And then also the second one is achieving a reduction of its ecological footprint. The, fourth, the third one is the minimization of negative environmental, economic, and so on uh, in regard to resources, natural resources. All re actually related to how we manage natural resources in a campus. Next. This declaration is very interesting because it was signed by 500 university presidents and chancellors from after 50, uh, over 50 countries. This is about university leaders for sustainable uh, future. There are 10 points that they are agree upon uh, in the declaration. Next. When we are talking about transformation model uh, to become sustainable university, if you can see in the triangle in the middle, sustainable campus, there are three aspects, three uh, approaches. The first one is internal approaches. We are talking about internal campus. And then external approaches. We are also talking about community surrounding the campus. And academic uh, res uh, approaches. This is talking about curriculum, study program, and so on, within the campus. Next. And all of them actually depending on uh, uh, leadership commitment of the campus, from the campus. Next. So we actually need sustainability leaders. Next. Uh, I'm, I took two definitions of sustainability leaders. Actually, and there are many uh, different kind of uh, uh, definition of sustainability leaders. The first one, anyone who takes responsibility for understanding and acting upon complex sustainability challenges. And the second one is uh, any eco-sensitive eco leadership. Again, it's talking about natural environment. Next. We know about this, uh, uh, and in general, good leadership is, uh, they have to have a good vision, uh, good decision, and so on, until performance. This is very general uh, leadership, good leadership. 
Next. How about sustainability leadership? There are five principles. The first one is understanding the interconnection of the system, uh, people, objects, processes, and so on. The second one, think globally and toward the future. The third one, protect nature, nature and people. The fourth one, transform business, not as usual. So we are not talking about as, uh, business as usual. You have to have uh, many ideas. And then lead by example in your actions. So you are as uh, to have to become living uh, example, living uh, good example as a leader. Next. There is also seven principles of sustainability leadership. Yeah. Before only five, there is also seven principles. The first one is sustainable leadership last, and then sustainable leadership spread must be a shared responsibility. Sustainable leadership is social just, has to be resourceful, and promotes diversity, and also activists, usually, and system must, must support sustainable leadership. The system within the campus must support the sustainable, sustainable leadership in campus. Next. There is another one, 10 pillars of sustainable leadership. Uh, the first one is change orientation, broad system thinking, and so on, until mentoring and development. So there are many principles that has to be uh, uh, characterized by uh, on sustainable leadership in campus. Next. How to develop sustainable leadership in higher education institution? Next. In my opinion, there are five uh, factors. The first one is education. I cannot read that. Experience, coordination, and then in, uh, infrastructure and environment, and also organization. Next, education. It's very big role. Doesn't matter whether the education is formal or non-formal education, or even lifelong education. Increase in knowledge and understanding of sustainability. Very important to become sustainable leadership a leader in campus. Next, next again. Next. The second one, experience. It's very good to have uh, experience starting from the lowest level, starting from the beginning. So you have experience on leading leadership and also understanding sustainability. Involved in various programs, inside or outside the organization. Involved in each stage, so you have to have uh, experience in each stage. Internship, visiting other organizations, for example, comparative studies, and then given program responsibility. So you have to have responsibility to run the program. And the next one. And the third one is coordination. Determine the success of the program. It's a special ability and skill to determine the success of program. Coordination within, uh, within organization, uh, even uh, both horizontal and vertical. Even with inside and outside of the organization, when you are in uh, university, for example, you have to have a coordination with another office outside the uh, universities. And also the function uh, is executed, for example, SDG center, for example. Next. Infrastructure environment. You have, you need to have infrastructure and environment that support the program when you are uh, becoming uh, sustainability leadership in a campus. Infrastructure environment in line, I mean, has, it has to be uh, the same line with what we are going to do with the programs. Reducing financial and environmental impact. Next. Organization has to be strong organization support. You have to have a very supportive organization. Appropriate vision and mission related to sustainability. 
structures that meet the needs, and then highly committed team. You cannot work alone. You have to be supported by your team. Building sustainability culture within the campus and clear business processes. Next. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability office. Uh, this is uh, my experience within nine years of involving university management. In Indonesia, not all of the university has sustainability office or in case of Diponegoro University, we have SDG center. Uh, when we are talking about the position in the stru organization structure, for example, it can be separate office or units. It can be under the director or the president of university. Uh, you can also coordination with vice rector and related issues. And then also it can be under the bureau if you have a bureau in your university. Next. How about task? They have to develop a program and then coordinate the program, disseminate the program to uh, stakeholders within the university, encourage and motivate units, monitor developments, and then report to management. You have to have a regular report to the management of universities. You have to also write an uh, annual report. You have to think about ranking and so on. Next. At the, how, what is the advantages of having sustainability office? The person in charge is clear. So we know where to see, where to ask as if something uh, occur, for example. More focus, focus when you have a sustainability office. And there is also clear program and targets. It's very easy to monitor of the program, for example. Easier to link to other program if there is a sustainability office. Next. Education, study programs, for example, we can introduce to study program what kind of uh, uh, courses that you can develop in the study program related to sustainability. Similarly with university program, activity of student is academic and administrative staff has to be related to sustainable uh, program within the university. Next. Uh, how about research and community services? Like in Diponegoro University, we have research and community services uh, team. They have to have a direction to sustainability, SDG for example. And then we also have to provide research type, research which related to SDGs. And then availability of funding. And then also publication about sustainability. Seminar, webinars on sustainability, on SDGs, for example. Next. Very important as well about infrastructure. When you have sustainability office, they can suggest to the management that when, you, when they build building, for example, it has to be green and smart buildings. They have energy efficiency, water waste treatment, water efficiency, and also very importantly, defable facilities. Next. Human resources. You need expert availability, availability of expert who can support you, who also understand about sustainable development goals, for example, and their participation, and also the interaction and programs and activities. Next. Environment around the campus, green and open spaces, very important uh, for sustainability office to remind the management about green and open space. Also for water absorption, campus forest, for example, campus park, uh, planting plants, and so on. Next. So in conclusion, uh, the first one, sustainability leaders are needed in higher education institutions at all levels. Not only top management in the university, but at all levels. The second one, balance of complexity of universities with the demands of being sustainable university.
It's not easy, but we have to try to do that. The third one, the development, the development of sustainable leadership in, is influenced by several factors. Education, experience, coordination, infrastructure and environment, uh, and also organizations who support you as a leader in the university. Next. Uh, yes, this is only a list of reference. I think that's all I can say to you. Thank you, Budesi. Terima kasih. Thank you. Big applause for <laughs> Professor Ambarianto for the enormous speech. So, Professor Ambarianto has talked about the what is the uh, sustainability leaders and uh, how actually the university as the environment that can create the leader who can think and act and conduct in the sustainability pathways. He also uh, highlighted the importance of the presence of sustainability office in, within the university. And um, I think that is the perspective of ideal, how the university systems can create a sustainability leaders. So I think the uh, students here that coming from 45 universities around the world, I think you can start to, you know, analyze this within your university, whether the availability of a university um, sustainability office or somehow that some setting and infrastructures that available in your university, that it could be a good systems for the university to create uh, sustainability leaders. Uh, so we will ask um, the audience if they have any questions related to, oh wow, I think you're pretty popular, Prof. Ambar. <laughs> There's a lot of questions here, so I will take one from this side. First, the lady with the glasses, and another uh, young Sustainability leaders, I think, in the, this role, yeah, with the glasses as well. And then someone in the back who say hi to me. Yes, please. You can uh, start to raise your questions for the first session. So, okay, thank you for the opportunities. My name is Fanny Shagin and I'm from you know, the Ponogoro University. In my university itself, there's green building implementation such as impactful programs such as training, educational materials, activities, and also there's innovative programs such as automatic water, station, electric, recycle, Zeta green manufacturers, and also digital food technologies installed uh, that calls rope calendar. So what, what I would like to ask is, what are the indicators that we could use to say that our university is green enough? Thank you. Oh, oh we, we're very sorry that because we are in a like really <laughs> long distance in here. Can you once again uh, repeat the questions? The questions only. And your name and uh, where you come from, please. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Fanny Shagian, and I'm from the Ponegoro University. Oh, you're from the uh, Undip, yeah? Yep. Okay. And Questions? I would, I would like to ask that, uh, what is the indicators that we could use to say that our university is green enough? Like, in Undip itself, there's called green building implementation, such as uh, training, educational materials, activities, and also there's uh, innovative programs such uh. as automatic water station, electric yep. recycle, paperless office management, Zeta yep. Green manufacturers, and also there's digi digital food technologies that called Rob Calendar. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so, so you mentioning like how we can state that the university is a green campus, yeah, with all those uh, programs that we already created. So it's already ideal enough or you, we need to, you know, expand the facilities to be like, you know, in more advanced way, uh, like that, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. we will hold the first questions. The second questions, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Bestani Sudata and I am from 
Gajah Mada University. Uh, I want to ask about the paradigm of education. There is a gap of between paradigm of education between uh, urban and suburban area, especially in Yogyakarta. And uh, they think the higher education are costly, yeah, cost a, a lot of money. Uh, many of them, especially their parents, don't know that uh, many opportunities like scholarship, uh, but, but not much of this information reach to the community, especially in village. So my question is, uh, how do you mobilize or organize student or student organize student organization to be able to reduce the that gap of education paradigm education because uh, there are many people that afraid of higher education because this is costly or a lot of cost to to reach okay thank you yeah Thank you from UGM, yeah, Gajah Mada University, asking related to education's paradigm. Yeah, so because uh, in urban and suburban area, so many people doesn't have a good access of the scholarship information or education's information for the higher education so that they have afraid. They have the, the, the things that, oh yeah, I can't go that way because it's very expensive, yeah, sort of way, yeah. So is there any uh, movement or any programs that, uh, you know, created by the university to reduce those uh, problems? That's correct, right? Okay, so that's the second question. The third question, please. Uh, I think, yeah, someone in the back. Um, yeah, I think this is our students as well, yeah? Uh, good morning, good morning, afternoon. Uda dua jam dua belas lebih. Nah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Hello everybody, my name is Lalaina. I'm from Madagascar and uh, I'm studying at Undip. Thank you very much, uh, Bapak Profesor, uh, for your intervention. So, um, first of all, I would like to, to thank UNDIP for the, the initiative that UNDIP has taken thus far related to sustainable development and um, the fact that UNDIP is uh, making a lot of effort to help students to, you know, to run together towards that goal. Uh, for example, keadaannya uh, bis kampus itu kan bagus banget. Nah, and I also hope that in the future more actions will be taken uh, for us to to go towards that goal like uh, more um, actively. Nah, I'm also thankful for the fact that uh, there is an office that is in charge of uh, sustainable development and uh, environmental um, matters. Uh, my question is, Papa Professor, is it possible to reach you and to work together for some uh, uh, publications related to the ocean and the blue economy? Because I think that that is related to SDG 14 the life under the ocean, because actually that is my, itu bidang saya di dalam penelitian. So um, as I read your uh, background, I guess that marine uh, activities and uh, marine science and everything related to the sea is uh, indeed your uh, domain. So that was my question. Is it? possible to work with you and to, to work with your office like on some publications or some articles related to blue economy and uh, marine government governance thank you so much yeah thank you zarina from madagascar uh, laina zara lalaina oh lala 
my God. Or liner. I haven't had my lunch, so that's why <laughs> my hearing is not really good. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. So um, you you actually uh, highlighting that Universidad de Ponogoro having some uh, coastal regions educations, and then would you like to do some uh, what deep interview for those? Cooperation or? Collaboration. Yes. Okay, yeah, collaborations, yeah, of course. After this, uh, Professor Ambarianto will give you some uh, highlights about Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, yeah. Uh, first question is related to the green campus facilities. Uh, okay. Uh, what, uh, what happened at Universitas Bonogoro, for example, when you are asking about the green campus facilities, is that your question? Like the ideal, ideal type of green campus, what kind of facilities? Okay, okay. Uh, to achieve green campus, it's a continuous improvement. There is no, there is no stopping barrier in that you are already achieved green campus, but also, uh, it's always uh, continuous improvement. For example, uh, green building, for example, there is a standard for that. Uh, Universitas Bonogoro now, whenever they are, uh, whenever we are uh, uh, built a building for something, we consider about green uh, requirements to become mm -hmm. green Agreed. building, for example. Yeah. We also try to reduce uh, CO2 emission mm -hmm. by having uh, campus bus, for example. Mm -hmm. We also uh, we have uh, many different programs, for example, uh, joining your friend when you go to campus rather than having their own motorbike, for example. By yourself. You can go with your friend, so it reduces one motorbike rather than two, and we are planning uh, to, to expand the, the extent of cam uh, campus bus to Diponogoro Statue, as, uh, as you know, it's quite far away, Diponogoro Statue with the horse. It's trying to, uh, we are also collaborate with this uh, uh, city government. So there is a bus from city government enter the campus. That's to reduce students and also staff to bring motorbike or mob, mob or cars to campus. Mm. Yeah. So again, the highlight is to achieve green campus is a continuous improvement. Okay. And the second one, the second question. What kind of student activities or program that you can do to uh, to, to reduce the uh, the 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 problems the of yeah the gap of the lack of uh, information that giving to the suburban area? Okay, uh, he was asking also about the the cost of study at the university in Indonesia. Many students doesn't know whether if there are many scholarship yeah. as well. Your question, sure. right? This at the moment, high school graduates, if they don't know about scholarship, it's a it's a pity that they don't know. They have <laughs> they, they should know because there are so many scholarship available. Mm. Even when in the case of University of Bangkoro, when they try to apply to become student at Diponogoro University. We also put in the web PD uh, scholarship, for example. They can choose whether they are going to pay by themselves or they are expecting scholarship from the government. That's the first one. The second one, we can use uh, students' activities, uh, I don't know what it's called, KKN. Uh, uh, student Tildos. community service. Student, student community, community services. Yeah. We are planning to have student community services to the community around the campus. 
And as, as you know that we are sending uh, them to another cities, another kabupaten, regencies, for example, they can uh, inform the community over there that there are many different kind of scholarship. In, I think in Gajah Mada also available many scholarship for students, I think. Yes. Yeah. And the third question. Collaboration. Uh, collaboration with us, it's very welcome. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all of you from overseas or from Indonesia, if you are interested to collaborate with Diponegoro University, um, it's very welcome because it's under my authority as well. So, <laughs> so you can send a letter to me or yeah. to the rector and then we can process the, com uh, the <laughs> collaboration. I think that's all. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Amarianto. Big applause for Prof. Amarianto, yeah. So, once again, we invite. So, uh, Universitas Diponegoro is very open for the partnerships because we believe partnership will, you know, bring more impact well, to whatever we did. So, that's why uh, Prof. Amarianto, as the Vice Rector for Research Innovations and also Collaborations, opened doors for many collaborations opportunity that will come from all of you uh, students and also uh, invitations guests uh, that coming here today. Okay. Before you close, yeah. Budesi. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was hospitalized yesterday actually. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I have to be in the hospital right now. <laughs> but because I want to meet you all uh, participants, I come here. So, we're very welcome all of you participants from overseas and from Indonesia to Semarang to hopefully you can visit our campus. Isn't yeah. there any program to visit? Uh, there might be because <laughs> <laughs> the time frame is really tight, Prof. Um, yeah, we can arrange. Um, okay, again, <laughs> thank you very much for coming yeah. and I'm very happy to see you. Yeah, thank you. we all delighted to have all of you in here today. Uh, so, because the session has already been up, I think, pardon? No, I think uh, Prof. Amber has need to go to, to some, some, some other uh, occasions. So yeah, we close this uh, parallel sessions uh, today and thank you for having a really active participation and uh, yeah. We will wait till the uh, MC close this uh, event to have some lunch, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for Professor Dr. Insignor Ambarianto MSG, the Vice Rector for Research, Innovation and Collaboration. And thank you, Budesi who is very hungry, I think. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> okay. We will have a break. Don't worry for those of you who are very hungry right now. We will have a break for about an hour. And before that, let me inform you that after the break, we will have for the following agenda is forum group discussion that will take place also here in this meeting room and each participants will be divided into some groups or six subtopic of discussion so make sure that you will be joined those six subtopics okay now we will give you time to take a break and enjoy the lunch that have been served and make sure to return to the meeting room at 1 p.m. Thank you.
participants to come forward. We kindly invite all participants of this group to come forward. Please come forward. We already prepare seats for all of you. For the others, you may be seated. Okay, for group one, you may start anytime. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Imbun Virasin, or you can call me Nam Tan. Uh, I'm from Mahido University from Thailand, and here are my teammates. <laughs> so what we just discussed so far was mainly about Thank you. 
area and reduce the carbon dioxide from like re reduce the car usage. Speaking of this, there is also a system that like you can increase the greenway, which is not the road for the, the car, but you can just like encourage people to ride a bike more and walk more instead of using just car. So from our discussion, we just, uh, I just feel so lucky that I get to exchange our experience from different country and we get to learn what we can do, what, what can we do differently and we get the idea that we can just bring back to our home and make it a better place just like we can help each other on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very okay. Because we couldn't give any reward for them, so how about photo session? <laughs> that would be more than anything. <laughs> Everyone, please once again give round of applause for group setting and infrastructure. Thank you very much. And I'll be ready for group two for energy and climate change. Please come forward. Okay, Stephanie, you may start as you like, anytime. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Rudder, and I am from La Trobe University in Australia. Um, and today, our fantastic group that was looking at climate change and energy um, had a fantastic discussion about different things that our universities do on campus in order to try and um, address this topic of climate and energy. So we came up with some fantastic ideas that we would like to share with you all today. Um, so firstly, Saeed had a fantastic idea um, that we should create some kind of protocol or treaty for all universities to sign and address. Um, and this would have um, rules and regulations um, about the climate and energy. And this would then be followed by all universities to try and address this um, uh, on a global level because um, as Saeed recognised, some universities are doing a lot, while other universities don't, um, don't have as many actions to do. Uh, in this, it would be to improve communication between policy um, in different countries to the protocols, and so providing funding to support the initiatives. So it's gonna be about communicating between the different universities, because some universities might have access to different resources or information um, additionally, we would aim to try and work together with either the private sector or the government. Um, different universities have different capacity to do this, so um, we, we discussed today about how some universities can work with solar panel companies to have an agreement where they can be provided some that would then would be purchased over time, but then some universities may receive funding from the government to do this. 
Um, so it, it depends on the university. Um, and then I have another slide, please, if that's okay. Uh, the next slide, please. That's okay, I can just tell you. So, um, <laughs> oh, it's beautiful, okay. We would also like to um, prioritize community services and programs to teach and educate people in rural areas. So we discussed how um, in Indonesia, it's a requirement of the university students to go out and do community work and volunteering. And that would be a, a good way to encourage students to engage in the climate um, in the area of climate change, so they could utilize that, that uh, workforce. And then also to bring um, changes to the study program and evolve them within the university, so they can, the students can implement um, studies in their field or working together um, based on their um, individual majors. Uh, additionally, also making national policies towards using um, either utilising walking or bicycles, alternative forms of transportation to get to university. Uh, we discussed how Malaysia has a, a fantastic um, way to address this where only the final students are allowed to drive to campus um, and the first and second year students have to uh, take their motorbike or public transport um, and if they're breaking this policy then they get fined. So. There are some, um, some fantastic things that some universities are doing that could be taken up by others. Um, but the goal around this would be to create uh, a protocol for all universities that they can prescribe to. Um, and then making a, a university student council, so this could be managed by the students, um, so then all uh, can help, the, help emphasizing this program and relating it back to the environment. So that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, another photo session? <laughs> I'm really sorry because we couldn't give any present for all the speakers, delegates, so. Once again, give applause for group number two, energy and climate change. Okay, next, be ready for group water and management, water management. <laughs> Prof. Viwi harus ikut ke atas juga. <laughs> Tidak ada yang bisa mengelak. Okay, for group three, you may start anytime. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera everyone. My name is Daniel, I'm from Malaysia, I'm from UMT and I've discussed regarding uh, water, water management with my friends here and we've come to a conclusion that there are lots of things and lots of expect, uh, aspects that we can uh, think about and improve or maybe implement regarding water management okay so we've classified uh, our water management into a few classifications so first is source uh, source by I mean like it is important to know where we get our water from and make sure it's from a sustainable source uh, usage uh, it is it is crucial for us to use our water properly, efficiently, and uh, effectively. Uh, and then after we use it, we think about how we're going to treat our water to make sure that we, after the treatment, we can discharge, either we can discharge it to uh, natural resources, natural reservoirs, or recycle it for our own reuse. And then water reuse management, by reuse management, I mean, um, we 
use the water that we have uh, to to fill our fill our flower pots or maybe reintroduce the wa water into a natural ecosystem. Okay, for let's go uh, into the next part where we go in depth on how each uh, universities and from different countries apply this uh, apply this. Yeah, next slide, please. Huh. Is it available? Is there next slide? Okay, thank you very much. So, so first, um, these are what we've uh, discussed with each other, what we've implemented in each university. Okay, first. Um, in Indonesia, universities in Indonesia, it's really popular to use uh, Biopore. It's a really new concept to me. This implementation has opened my eyes uh, on how we can manage, especially uh, flash floods in the university, Biopore. And then we used, uh, under, under here is uh, rain harvest, how uh, people are using rain as the water resource, which is a really important uh, resource, especially amidst the scarcity of water given, given to us from other resources. And then we have, <coughs> and then to control our uh, water usage, universities have uh, implemented, implemented efficient appliances, uh, for example, as we can see, Undip, uh, our obvious example, have implemented smart devices like tap waters that are automatically, uh, they would automatically turn on and then would shut off once you take your hands away or maybe a flushing system for the toilet that limits how much we flush based on uh, our usage. All right, next is better discharge. This one is implemented by universities that have water treatment plants or IPAL. IPAL, they call it in Indonesia. It's a really new word for me, thank you. So this better discharge can be applied by all the universities, especially the ones who are uh, really connect, connected to natural water reservoirs. For example, our university in Malaysia, my university, University of Malaysia, Trangganu, we are located next to the sea and we are really connected to the sea. So the way we think about water is if we discharge water improperly, we are directly, almost immediately affecting our aquatic lives. So it is really important for us to treat our, bed, our water that we might have used from the natural resources and then discharge something even better than what we have gotten from it. And then the final part is, uh, this one is an example from uh, Malaysia where in my university, we've implemented a system where we separate sewerage for rainwater and use water system. For this system, the use water is enclosed. After we use it, we flow it into an enclosed uh, treatment or sewerage so that the rainwater, if it rains, it won't, it won't be added into that used reservoir. So what, what, what's going to ultimately happen is that rainwater would not be disrupted. We won't be touching or disturbing or changing the chemical composition of rainwater. And it will be discharged for the plants and discharged into natural reservoirs, benefiting the fishes. Okay, um, for an additional information, uh, after discussion, we've seen that uh, different, different universities and different countries may face different issues. And one of the points that I would like to, I'd like to uh, bring forward is uh, a, a problem in Uzbekistan. My friend Ferus here, he's from Uzbekistan and 
His country is landlocked, unlike Indonesia or Malaysia. Landlocked countries are really limited on uh, their water resources. So he finds it, their, their nation finds it really important to economize the water. And it becomes crucial and also selen uh, desalination is needed uh, because the mineral levels in their water is too high for human consumption. So this has opened my eyes to um, what different things that we're thinking, uh, the problems that we have to deal with. They're really different uh, from depending on where you're from. So all in all, I think that uh, we all here, all around the world, all around the globe, should use our water properly and we should and must uh, make others who are managing certain certain areas better than us as set them and set them as an example and consult and implement their methods so that inshallah in the future we would have a more and absolutely sustainable way of managing water that is all from us thank you very much thank you very much for group three now please take a photo first before return to your seats Uh, Mas boleh background videotronnya dikembalikan dulu. Oke. Okay. Be ready for group 4. After this is your time for waste management to share the result of the discussion. Please give applause for group 3 water management. Okay, next, waste management, please come forward, all the participants and also the leader. Okay, five minutes, please. <laughs> five minutes for the presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Let me introduce myself My name is Dini I am from Bakri University, Jakarta, Indonesia I want to share the result of my discussion with my friends About waste management From the result of the discussion earlier My friends and I on campus carry out many programs or activities in waste management uh, such as our uh, composting, waste bank, farming smart green communities, uh, research about waste and other. And as for some conclusion that we get, we get are first, we can important of student organization to reduce waste. Uh, the second, we can being creative te technology for waste management. The third, supporting program through technology to spread awareness through. Um, the fourth, how to make ways it uh, for scholarship. And the fifth, uh, the fifth uh, we can develop three uh, R is reduce reuse recycle. Into four R is reduce re recycle and re re plus rating. Uh, finally, we can. <coughs> We can education for students about waste management because the fact in the field there are still many people who find it difficult to dis distinguish between organic and unorganic waste because of the because as youth we need to continue to voice out the two people to be more concerned about the waste issue or waste problem. So that I can explain message from me, let's save our earth, let's save our earth by taking care of our earth. We will be happy and prosperous. Salam lestari. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Okay, thank you very much for group four. Please, um, we take another photo. Once again, please give applause for group waste management. Okay, now for group five, transportation. Please come forward for all the participants and also Budiana. Five minutes for the presentation, please. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. We are from the group five about uh, transportation. So um, from our discussion, we are focusing more on the um, sustainable transportation in the university itself, in the Scope University. And uh, from our discussion mm, yesterday, we already know that there is a policy and also some effort from our universities to implement the sustainable uh, transportation itself, such as creating the um, the electric bus and also reducing the CO2 emission in the campus area itself. But there are still some weakness uh, and um, that's why we find those kind of problems uh, in regard of those weakness itself. I would not really focus on the problems but I would just cite them. We will focus more on the solutions later. There is a lack of awareness from the people of why we should promote the sustainable transportation and also the outsiders come into the campus which contribute a lot into the production of the pollution itself in the campus. And also there are, mm, as there is the campus bus which is a really good solution that I, I really agree with, however sometimes it takes too long for the students to wait for it and uh, it can disturb the schedule so it is not really effective in itself. And also there are some inconsistencies with the policy and the feasibility of such policy in the university area. And the prohibition to park in the campus or faculty area, that is one of the um, regulations that is so made, is not really effective as um, it creates some crowded places also in other places as affecting the outside area of the university or even the area of the university itself. And lastly, the imbalance between the campuses. For example, only past two campuses, the one in Tembalan and the one in Playburan. And some of our students here uh, just say that there are some imbalances between the facilities which can lead also to um, an inconsistency. As for the solution, the first one is regarding the GPS bus system. Having the bus, electric bus, is very good. Uh, but for the students to be more aware of it and also for the students to uh, follow it in the right way, that should create an application so that the students can follow to track the bus itself, where it is at the moment, so that they, they don't have to wait too long and that everything will work effectively. Uh, for the second one is the parking card, uh, as to prevent the outsiders to enter in the campus, which contribute to the rise of CO2 emissions. The uh, university should make a parking card um, system as a scanning the barcode itself, uh, which will provide the more security for the campus itself, uh, thus making only the student uh, enter in the campus. Uh, the next one is uh, roof for pedestrians. You know, one of the main of reasons why the people don't want to walk, uh, because that is all can be a contribute to the um, sustainable transportation like uh, using our own body, because our own body is a means of transportation also. Um, when we ask Indonesian people, sorry, but I take the Indo example of Indonesian people, why don't you want to walk? Because it is too hot, because I am lazy, or because yeah, it's so demanding. 
Yeah, so to encourage them to walk or to use their body, we can provide them the facilities that it is in accordance with that, such as creating roof in the, for the pedestrian itself. In Undip, they already have the pedestrian um, road, but they can create some roof also in order to prevent some hot weather from the sun itself. And for the next one is zero emission day. There are some of our friends who come from UNS, Universidad de Blas Marriott University, who have that kind of um, a zero emission day. It is really effective. I've been in Solo um, last year, um, like two years ago, and I was kind of surprised at the beginning, like, wow, this is really effective actually because we'll see less cars and uh, motorbikes that enters the campus itself. So it will be very effective if Undi also has that kind of uh, 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 solution and also it will be good for the universities as uh, making a comparison. Uh, for the next one is raising the parking fee. This might be a bit controversial because uh, not everyone can afford it. However, if you use it in the right way, as uh, maybe other students may just think that okay, I have enough money to uh, to pay the parking fee, so I don't have to walk outside or not use my motorbike. I will still use it. But however, we will use that money obtained or collected from that parking fee that it is higher in a much uh, uh, sustainable way for the sustainable transportation itself. And uh, the last one is uh, the reward system. You know, um, human brains is quite complex. Uh, even though they don't want to do something, if you give them a little award, they will, they will make the effort to um, Pro, to contribute to that kind of uh, plan. And uh, as our main plan is for the sustainable transportation itself, uh, we will um, ask you giving any award for the student, for example, to use bike, um, to use um, cycle in the campus area itself. Uh, they will be interested, uh, for example, in uh, other universities, they have the voucher award. Uh, so anytime you contribute to the sustainable transportation, the campus will give you a voucher for you to eat in the canteen, and it will be very effective also as everyone will be contributing. So to summarize our main discussion, it's more about uh, awareness. Solutions is there, policy is there, but if we don't have any awareness about it, uh, it will be good for nothing. Yeah, that is all from our group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, please uh, take a picture first before we turn to your seats. Once again, please give applause for group transportation. Okay. We have last group now to present the result of the discussion, education and research. Please come forward. Please make it five minutes for presentations, Laina. Untuk slide-nya, minta tolong disiapkan, Mas. While waiting for uh, the technical arrangement. Yes, we're about to. Very good afternoon, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Perkenalkan, uh, my name is Andrea Mampiununa Lalaina Tien. I'm from Madagascar, and I'm here to represent my group. We we're from the group of uh, research and education. All right, so uh, while discussing. We've came to some few recommendations and ideas for the implementation of a green campus. Actually, our recommendations are based on students' involvement and uh, in response to three main issues, which are 
the lack of research supervision from professional and foundation for uh, the research publication. Second, urge the, to f the urge to formulate um, the research and sustain of sustainability through inclusive university system. And the last is uh, the insufficient research fund. Well, let's start without any further delay. Next slide. Good, good. Okay, it's okay. All right, so our suggestions are addressed um, towards three levels, which are academic, internal, and external. All right. Oh, oh my God, I'm sorry for the very little uh, writing. <laughs> so it's like, um, th the first one is uh, putting the SDGs point into leadership training to raise awareness about sustainability. Uh, maximizing digi digitalization of education system, like using less paper uh, and printing on the two sides of uh, the paper. Actually, that was a very good suggestion from, uh, from our friend from Pakistan. Thank you very much. And also uh, scholarships from, for uh, students who have a project related to SDGs. Uh, enhancing activities among students related to ecological protection, like planting trees or some other um, activities related to uh, ecology. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, can see it, but there is the role of uh, SDG Center as campus role. And then, oh, thank you. Uh, actually, there's still one point. But let's move on. <coughs> From the academic level too, actually before this, there is still putting, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> putting the sustainability vision, uh, sustainability and uh, sustainable, oh, I'm sorry, uh, putting the development, uh, the sustainable development as vision and mission of the campus um, like implementing policy uh, related to green campus, like uh, green metrics from uh, the Universitas Indonesia, um, and also raising competition among students. Now, yeah, baru di sini. Um, from the external, we have here some uh, some suggestions related to exchange program. And then collaboration with industry as one of uh, the stakeholders in SDGs implementation. Uh, and with the external communities like NGOs or government. Uh, we actually um, suggested those uh, collaboration because uh, it's, uh, it will make the, the papers or the, the research uh, results more credible because uh, the sources and the data that we are using are um, coming from many sources. All right. And then, yeah, uh, government also should uh, allocate like more funds to support research uh, related to sustainable development. Next slide, please. Right. So, uh, those are the idealization um, of Green Campus from my group. No paper policy. Um, what is this? I'm sorry. Ah, those are related to what I've just said uh, earlier. I'm sorry. Those are just the details of it, like uh, reducing the paper and uh, planting trees. And also, uh, related to the Green Center uh, in the campus, uh, there is also an, um, a suggestion to, to name, to nominate some eco-delegate from each class so that those, uh, those students can lead some activities uh, related to sustainable development with their colleagues. All right. Uh, that is emphasizing the role of uh, SDG's representa student representative. All right, uh, the next 
and the last one. So the main points are the partnership, partnership with uh, all the stakeholders and the universities. The stakeholders are industries, uh, governments, and NGOs, and so on. There is also the exchange program, relate, always related to uh, SDGs. Uh, fundings, especially fundings, uh, students who have projects related to, to SDGs, and then raising competitiveness and collaborations among students. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, group six. Take a picture first before you return to your seats. Thank you very much for the presentation. Once again, please give applause for group <laughs> education and research. One thing that we understand here is that it's very delighted to see all of the participants being together, join in a group and put all your thoughts in the discussion, although you don't know or you just met all the participants here. Okay. Declaration by the university student representatives from 13 countries in worldwide. Okay, now, kindly being invited to the front to be the representative of the 13 countries that will stand up here and being representative of the declaration recitation that we're about to recite. Representing Indonesia, Fian Tashvirul Afkar, please come forward. Next, representing Budapest, Aurelia Miranti Eriza. Please come forward. Representing Rwanda, Tuizere Fedeste. Please come to the stage.
Next, representing Australia, Stephanie Rudin. Next, representing France, Marius Gatouille. I'm sorry for the mispronounce of the names. <laughs> Next, representing Pakistan, Abiharana. <laughs> representing Madagascar, Randriana Riosan Dinaharila Olivia. <laughs> representing Malaysia. Muhammad Zarif Ilyasa bin Moh Zanil. <laughs> Malaysia. Okay. Representing Malaysia, Muhammad Zarif Ilyasa. Next, representing Sudan, Yasmin Amir Osman Abderazik. <laughs> representing Somalia, Abdirahim Ahmed Said. <laughs> Somalia. Abdirahim. Does anyone know where he is right now? Okay. Okay, next. Uh, to represent Thailand, I'm Boon Wiratsin. <laughs> next, to represent Uganda, Maiga Ayub Hussein. <laughs> and the 13th country, Representing Uzbekistan, Aziz Kuja. Okay, we're still waiting for someone from Somalia. Okay. Okay, now we kindly invite the representative of Indonesia to recite the International Youth Declaration. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Afkar from Universitas Indonesia. It is such an honor for me to represent you uh, reciting the declaration. Please recite after me. The International Youth Declaration on Sustainability 2022. The International Youth Declaration on Sustainability 2022. One. Ready to be the pioneer. Ready to be the pioneer. In maintaining balanced green space and protecting ecosystems. In maintaining balanced green space and protecting ecosystems. On the land as, as well as below water. On the land as well as below water. Two. Two. Ready to take a role. Ready to take a role. In the water conservation programs and initiatives. Three, ready to be the forefront for efficient energy use campaign and the use of renewable energy sources. Four, 
ready to reduce, reuse, and recycling. Ready to reduce, reuse, and recycling. Waste. Waste. As an effort to reduce an environmental impact. Five. Promises to use low emission vehicles and public transportation more often. Sixth, ready to become the agent of change to protect the environment and de delivering the education of sustainability on a wider scale. 22nd November 2022, Universitas Diponegoro, Semarang, Indonesia. On behalf of the representatives of 13 countries in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we kindly invite all the representatives here on the stage to one by one sign the declaration that you've already said before. Okay, we're gonna start with Indonesia, Vian Tashwiro Afkar. And please to sign five pages So you will be famous today because you need to sign five pages. <laughs> Next, Budapest, Aureli Biranti. Next, Rhonda Fedeste. Okay, next, Stephanie, Australia. Next, France, Marius. Ready, Pakistan, Abiha. Madagascar, Randriana Rison. Malaysia, Muhammad Zarif. Sudan, Yasmin Amir. Next, Thailand, Virat Sin.
Giganda Maiga. And Uzbekistan Aziz Kuja. After all the representatives signed all the five pages of the declaration, we kindly invite all participants to take picture again. This time, we'll take pictures with the document. <laughs> And maybe the representative can um, hold, there are five here, so maybe five of you can hold the documents and show it to, to the front so we can take pictures with all, also other participants. Please come. Please come forward. We need to show the documents to the front and also we kindly invite all participants All participants, please kindly come forward to take pictures. Um, maybe in front of the table? Yeah, maybe in front of the table. Guys, please. The others will be... <laughs> Okay, hold for a moment. We need preparation even only for a photo session. We do hope that this is something that you don't feel like you're being pushed to do to sign the declaration or to agree with the declaration. I hope that this could be a commitment from all of us. As a young people to show to the worldwide that we are aware and will take part in every sector to support the sustainable development goals. Okay, now we kindly invite all participants. Okay, guys, um, really sorry. I need you to back a little bit. <laughs> or maybe you can use the stage also to take pictures. Okay, some of you you can stand on the stage and some of you on the down stage. Is there any phone that you that would like to take pic? <laughs> oh, guys, and I remember that. Please make sure to be part of 
or put a contribution on this event to share this event on your social media, especially Instagram. And please don't forget to tag UI Green Metric and also Undip. Especially for those who have many followers, I'm sure. <laughs> It will be difficult for those who are holding the document to give those. <laughs> yeah, any social media that you have? TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. YouTube. One of you is a vlogger, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please give applause for all of us here today. Thank you very much for all the participants. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. Since we still have another session, we will allow you to take picture with this famous document. <laughs> but maybe later on, is it okay? Now, please kindly to return to your seats because we still have one more session. We still have speaker. Okay. Okay, guys. I'm really sorry. We still have another session coming up next. We'll give you time, don't worry. We will give you time to take picture with the document. But please, for now, take your seats. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Terima kasih. Okay, guys, now we will proceed to the next session. Eco Enzyme Workshop. And without further ado, 
will speak about ecoenzyme as the alternative of organic waste measurement to support sustainability. Now please help me welcome our speaker, head of ecoenzyme team of UI Green Metric World University Rankings Network, Dr. Insinyur Nur Zaina Ginting MSH. Okay, I will deliver a short brief of Dr. Nurzai Naginting biography. She's a lecturer in Sumatra Untara University. Her expertise in biotechnology. She has won several research grants, including Casindo Project, its development and strengthening capacity for energy policy formulation and implementation of sustainable energy projects in Indonesia. She attend as a presenter at national and international conferences and published a lot of papers on bioenergy, biofertilizer, and biofeed topics. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Nur Zaina Ginting. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I also, I would like to say uh, my gratitude to the uh, first International Student Leaders Meeting 2020 Committee. Uh, so, you guys, you just have your declaration, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Uh, I remember Abiha from Pakistan. Abiha, okay. Yeah, I sweet participant <laughs> you have just your declaration but somehow I have in my mind something like this uh, Abiha yes mama how about the food waste in the kitchen oh just please mama just recycle the waste because I already have my declaration <laughs> So, don't do that, please, all of you, because you have just declaration yourself. And also, like, Zarif from Malaysia. Okay, if your mama have fruit waste in the kitchen, don't ask your mama to finish it. Okay. <laughs> and all of you. So, a, this afternoon, I will give a simple lecture. Okay, Abiha? Okay. I will try to treat you as my friend because according to uh, research, something that given as a friendly matter, it will be processed in your brain better. Okay? So remember it. If something present to you in a nice way, it will be processed in your brain better. Uh, the topic is ecoenzyme as the alternative of organic waste management to support sustainability. Uh, actually, my presentation aims to show you a simple technology that must be used consistently. The keyword is consistently okay uh, this technology is a kind of uh, fermentation that has a benefit multiple benefit okay next so all of us in our countries have a municipal solid waste something like this smells so bad produce methane yeah and the cost to process all the solid waste is very expensive 
So in Indonesia, about 55% of this organic waste is uh, coming from food waste and 5% of the food waste is being recycled. Only 5%. The average amount of waste generated in 2003 was 0 0.5 up to 0 0.8 kg per person per day and currently has escalated to 1.7 kg per person per day and as a result, higher costs and critical management of waste disposal are needed to overcome this issue. Okay, next. So this is the food waste. It's categorized as an organic solid waste because containing an enormous amount of organic matter which eventually decay and generates carbon dioxide and methane. The common disposal method to dispose of organic waste is dumping, dumping it into landfill. Has caused serious environmental pollution and health, health risk problem to living organism. Next. So this is the top five municipal solid waste generators annually. This is uh, India, United States, China, Brazil, and my country, Indonesia. <laughs> the World Bank in 2012 released that the production of solid waste in the world is so fast that it has an impact on climate change and also has a direct impact on very high cost. And this is not funny. The cost of treating solid waste soared to 375 billion uh, US dollar per year from the previous 205 billion in 2012-25 due to the increase in solid waste by 70% from the original 1.3 billion tons of waste per year to 2.2 billion tons per year. So this report is a warning to immediately make serious effort in managing solid waste in the world. Okay, next. So, this is an example, you know, the water that is a biggest lake in, uh, I think in Southeast Asia. The, the lake is in my home country, Toba Lake, is a destination tourism area. But you see there is a pig pen next to the Toba Lake, pig pen. So the world's population is predicted to grow by 2.4 billion people by two, 2050, putting additional strain on agricultural system for food, fuel, and fiber production, and posing a threat to their ability to achieve food security and environmental sustainability. Municipal solid waste, agricultural waste, and livestock waste have a high organic content which pollutes environment as soil and water and air. So, all of you will become a leader, okay? And you already hear what I told you in this lecture. So, even though this is uh, only about waste, but the effect is severe, yeah? So when you uh, become a leader one day, just remember, yeah, uh, you have to put your uh, concentration also on the waste. Okay? Next. This is in my campus, Universitas Sumatera Utara. In order to reduce the amount of solid waste production, especially food waste, is one of the best method that can be applied is the fermentation of organic waste into the ecoenzyme. So in this method, organic waste is converted into useful enzyme through the fermentation process. We use uh, fruit peel 
from the canteen as the material for the fermentation process. Next. Ah, me and my students, okay. Uh, we do a uh, community service in the goat pen, dairy goat pen. So uh, we process the fruit peel into uh, eco enzyme and later we use to disinfect to disinfect uh, the pen also to use it as a starter for the uh, goat uh, faces uh, so uh, through doing this we reduce the odor of the pen and minimize microbial contamination on the milk okay next uh, this is some of my uh, paper from my research uh, the, uh, the title the illusion of ecoenzyme and antimicrobial activity against tapilococcus aureus and then ecoenzyme disinfection in pig housing as an effort to suppress Escherichia coli population all of this is uh, pathogen uh, bacteria that harm uh, the animal harm also the human okay next also a two-stage uh, research a two-stage fermentation process for the production of bio disinfectant and then alternative bio disinfectant for salmonella and escherichia coli contamination in duck eggs uh, in indonesia many people prefer to consume raw duck eggs they combine with uh, herbs, we call it jamu. So, if they consume the contaminated duck eggs, not only in Indonesia, not only in Indonesia, I read that in British, I, they prefer to have dressing that uh, use a raw eggs. Okay? And the cases of salmonellosis uh, somehow comes from the Salmonella, salmonella contamination. So, if you, if we uh, disinfect the the pan or disinfect the egg, hopefully uh, we can reduce the salmonellosis uh, cases. So, uh, next, because salmonellosis cases uh, harm not only uh, our because if salmonella salmonella tv infect us uh, the, and cause a salmonella and salmonellosis so yeah typhus we call it in indonesia typhus uh, it's not cause an illness to us but it also could be uh, could cause uh, a death yeah uh, and we have to spend a lot of money when we try to cure us, okay? In addition to ecoenzyme, to enzyme, this ecoenzyme also contain of organic acid. Uh, organic acid are also produced so that the pH of the ecoenzyme becomes acidic, which is around three. Various benefits are obtained from ecoenzyme due to its enzyme and organic acid. Next, uh, this is a community service also in the uh, dairy cow. So we use ecoenzyme as a bio disinfectant because it is effective in reducing contamination from various pathogenic bacteria. Uh, either in pig pens, goats, and cows. Uh, okay, okay, next. Uh, also, uh, this is, I was in the center of citrus cultivation. So, uh, in the center, uh, citrus center, so many uh, rotten orange, 
rotten orange caused by uh, tons of spoiled orange caused by fruit flies okay uh, dump dump in the environment uh, also there are orange that are left over under the trees or in the garden while this orange contains of drosophila melanogaster fruit fly and we cannot we we should not leave the the rotten orange uh, in the garden because uh, the fruit flies will hatch the egg will, will hatch and then uh, harm again the orange fruits so we have to kill all the the drosophila yeah how yeah well, uh, maybe for example we could uh, uh, use them as the material for making eco enzyme eco enzyme next next please so this is a uh, rotten orange uh, they just dump it in the environment uh, in citrus orchard center in indonesia rotten orange must be collected from the orchard because they contain fruit fly eggs like i told you before so the solution for rotten orange is processed through ecoenzyme so, uh, in one way. Yeah, okay, next. So this is uh, me and my students do the community uh, services uh, on the citrus village. Next. So for the material of the ecoenzyme, we can use uh, fruits or uh, peel or the peel of the fruits okay uh, not only orange but any kind of uh, fruits tomorrow we will have a uh, a simple uh, practical on uh, what is it what is the place the name the, the name Jepara. okay maybe about 15 minutes uh, this is the owner of the uh, citrus uh, plantation. They are very happy. They, they have ecoenzyme because on June we uh, teach them how to make ecoenzyme. So because it takes three months for the ecoenzyme process. So June, July, August, September, September we already uh, we also say harvest we harvest the ecoenzyme and put it in the bo in the bottle okay next so instead instead of only fermented uh, fruits we can also re-ferment it again by and putting uh, a kind of plants that contain sec secondary metabolites yeah, uh, for in Indonesia, we use plants like Acorus calamus, Agave salana, Tinospora cordifolia, uh, as a source of uh, secondary metabolites, because secondary metabolites has a antimicrobial uh, properties. So, uh, for you that come from the fourteen countries. Uh, I need you for tonight to try to find uh, a plan in your country that contains of metabolites, con secu uh, secondary metabolites. Uh, but I remember in Australia, because I have my master degree in, in Perth, uh, they have rosemary there. Rosemary and then a a, a nice a nice uh, odor of flower uh, the color is purple I forgot the name but somehow we can use it as a disinfectant to protect us from mosquitoes do you remember what is the name purple color nice odor a yeah lavender okay 
Lavender, okay, yes. Lavender. And rosemary, I read that they have a antimicrobial properties. Next. Ah, I do uh, my team uh, and I, we had a community service also in Islamic boarding school. Uh, this school has uh, 4,000 students who live in the dormitory. They eat there. They can consume also uh, fruit. Uh, whenever they consume fruit, like orange, they need about 600 kilos. And because I already counted, uh, weighed the, 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 the fruit uh, peel, the orange peel, it's about 60 kg. So we produce a lot of ecoenzyme. And we use it to clean the floor in the dormitory. You see like that the Rukoya dormitory, it, uh, it what is it? Uh, about hundred, uh, a thousand of uh, girls, high school, Islamic high school girls live there. And they are very happy because uh, they don't have to buy a commercial clean floor cleaners. They can make it by themselves from the uh, orange peel. So, and also, uh, we, they use the ecoenzyme in the kitchen to clean all the utensil when they, uh, eat, what is it, uh, plate, glass, yeah, and uh, the effect is not only uh, the utensil become more cleaner, but also the sewerage. Uh, before they use the ecoenzyme, the sewerage, uh, the smell is so bad. Okay, because uh, soap, commercial soap, it kills uh, good microbes on the sewerage. So. Whenever we uh, use, uh, we adding uh, ecoenzyme when we clean the utensil, it goes to the water, to the sewerage, and by the enzyme, it uh, change the, uh, what is it, we, we call it uh, the community, the biota in the uh, sewerage, yeah? Uh, next. So this is the girls. They are very happy. They mop their own room. They don't have to buy it. Okay. Next. Uh, we will have a videos of uh, ecoenzyme. Okay. Operator, please click on it. Yeah. It only takes three months, but some some uh, some of my friends ask me how how it takes so long three months for the fermentation. Okay. Uh, it takes a a long time research to uh, conclude that the fermentation the be the best fermentation time is three months. Whenever you do it in, in one month, the enzyme is not produced uh, optimally. Also in two months, but in three months, it's okay. Also the organic acid, okay? Uh, is there any question from you? Okay. Oh, where's the moderator? Okay. Actually, I'm not the moderator, but it's okay if there's any question from the participants. Okay. 
And since I'm not the moderator, so I'm afraid I couldn't resume the discussion. Thank you. So once again, my name is Daka. Okay, so um, just for the real quick question, my question would be, um, is there any way to speed up the fermentation? Because like, um, especially, I think it's a good program for the mothers in household that um, their, their household waste uh, should be put it, uh, and turn it into the, uh, this echo enzyme. And um, you know, mothers in home cannot uh, have a much patience to wait for like three months. Is there any way to, to speed it up, miss? Thank you so much. Okay. If you want to speed up, just say to mama, mama, please buy a stealer. Oh, okay. Yes. Electric, what, electric what is a stealer? stealer? Yeah, if you do it with stealer, you can cut into something like 24 days. Oh, okay. Yes. 24 days. Yes. That's why, uh, like me, I already three, three years, I don't buy a floor cleaners commercial. Okay. I don't buy uh, toilet cleaners, especially, by the way, especially for Indonesia, for the toilet in the campus. Because in Indonesia, we have wet toilet. Yeah. So, the smell is so nice. <laughs> toilet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you use eco enzyme, because we don't have to buy anything when we do the process, just waiting for three months, so okay. you, you can use as long as much as you want to uh, use it in the toilet. Okay. So campus will not complain the, what is it, the, the cleaners, because it cannot use, uh, it cannot only once to clean the toilet in the campus. So many students, and everybody need to go to the toilet. Yeah, so uh, for me, myself, if, if, I, uh, if you come to my house, you will see a lot of echo and some pile. Mm. Some volume 150 liters, because I need a lot of echo enzyme. Okay. Yeah, I, I need to clean uh, my goat pen. I have goat at my home. Yeah, the goat just uh, delivered a baby okay. before I go to this conference. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's another job. I have so many cats. I have chicken. Yeah, it's like a small uh, a zoo okay. in my home. So I need a lot. Mm. I do it to clean. Uh, toilet floor to do it uh, the what is it at home to clean the floor yeah, yeah. since uh, pandemic I don't buy anything to clean I mean the uh, chemical cleaner mm. yeah I just and also to clean my uh, table the the glass because my cat goes to the top of the, uh, <laughs> the the table and I love animals so I cannot just push 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 yeah. Yeah. if you want to stay on the table just stay there yeah. I can clean it with echo enzyme yeah. <laughs> just like that okay okay thank you for the answer miss yeah okay uh, yeah Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Bu Nur Zaina, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, are there certain criteria for organic waste that can be used as eco enzyme? What about cooked vegetables? Can the waste still be used as an eco enzyme? And the second question is, um, Bu Nur Zaina, ever research the use of water um, eceng gondok as an eco enzyme? Because I saw a lot of uh, eceng gondok west in around the Ciujung and Cidurian River in province of Banten. 
I thought can this eco enzyme be a solution for uh, etching gondok quest? Thank okay. you. Okay, actually, uh, eco enzyme is one way a to uh, process waste. Okay, uh, you don't have to use a good fruit. You can use reject fruit. So. Uh, whenever I want to uh, do a eco enzyme, I just go to the fruit sellers and choose the fruit that is not good anymore. Yeah, before they throw the fruit, usually they just give me free, or I buy with a very cheap price. Uh, for etching gondo, you can also use to as a material for eco enzyme. But uh, you must uh, remember the SOP. But you, you must read the SOP before that. We, we have to cut it, to cut the coenzyme, eh, the cut the etching gondo and uh, put it into the big pile. Give it uh, water. Water. We we don't use uh, chlorine water. Yeah. Uh, so we can we cannot use tap water. Use the the well well water. Or the rain, or the what is it? Uh, river, or something like that. Uh, tomorrow we will have a simple practical, and uh, I will also ask uh, to uh, email or email yeah all the procedure to making eco enzyme. Okay, okay. How about you, Zarif? <laughs> oh, you have. You are Z Zario, okay. Uh -huh. So, is there any of you who wants to ask? ask? Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an inquiry. Uh, since it is an enzyme, and I saw in one of the slides where you are applying it on a plant, doesn't it have uh, any reaction? I cannot catch your... Yeah, okay. Uh, since it is an enzyme, Mm. In one of your slides, I saw, I saw you apply it on a plant. Okay. So my question is, doesn't it have any reaction with uh, any of maybe the uh, uh, metabolites of the plant? Also, then when it gets to, to the soil, still since it is an enzyme, doesn't it, we, don't we have uh, issues of like maybe horizontal flow of genes to other organisms that are in the soil and then maybe affect the microbial uh, community? Has it been tested? Mm. Uh, I already conduct a research for go, uh, for pig. pig. Uh, because in Indonesia, uh, pig consume, uh, what is it? Uh, food that collected from restaurant. Oh, okay. And also, pig is giving a food from a rotten food from the market. So this is smelly thing, and contain uh, bacteria also. Okay, because leftovers food from the leftover restaurant, and then they don't cook it. Some of the pig owners cook again, but the others is not. So uh, we, we uh, conducted research. We, uh, what is it, uh, clean the floor of the pan uh, by dilute the echo enzyme 1 to 30. 1 to 20, 1 to 30, okay? And the effect, before we conduct the research, we take a uh, swipe the clean floor and uh, calculate the population of the microbes. And then after the application, we also calculate. And the population is decreased from, uh, I forgot the exact number, but uh, somehow like 10, 10 7. What is it? How, how could we say in English? 10 pangkat 7 become 10 pangkat 2. 
Yeah. 10 to fold 7, yeah, become 10 to fold 2. And you know, the, the microbe also lives on the skin of the pigs. So, and it also contaminates the meat. So if you eat like a pig meat, uh, undercooked, you can be contaminated by the uh, bacteria and cause salmonella, salmonella TV, yeah, all the apa, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal disease. Okay. Uh, uh, is it enough for your question? Okay. And if you see that plan, I show a uh, three kind of plan. That plan contains uh, secondary metabolites. So if we referment it again, the ecoenzyme for another three months, the strength of the ecoenzyme better to kill microbes. Okay. Is there any other question? Oh, one more question. Okay. Hello, assalamualaikum, uh, everyone. So uh, my name is Daniel. Again, I'm from Malaysia, University of Malaysia Terengganu. Okay. My background is fishery. So after listening about this secondary metabolites, about this ecoenzyme, I'm wondering if uh, first question is I'm wondering how much can we produce at once effectively? For example, if we're trying to apply this into a really big industry, uh, we can perhaps outsource all of the discard fruits or any vegetables. So, uh, uh, as I said again, what if we can uh, buy all of those discards for cheap, right? And then we make a really big uh, manufacturing plant for our secondary metabolites or ecoenzyme. How much can we make? in a batch at once uh, effectively and then second question is can we apply it to treat our um, fish husbandry system uh, our water cultivation um, during during our cultivation and after like uh, after cultivation and uh, regarding the water discharge can we use it to treat water okay Ecoenzyme is not antibiotic, like uh, commercial antibiotics. So, uh, if you uh, applicate it today, you can sell the fish tomorrow. No harm. Yeah. You know something? Some of us, some of my community of Ecoenzyme, we use the Ecoenzyme to clean our teeth, you know, because our teeth somehow contains uh, bacteria. Yeah. It's, uh, so if we uh, kumur kumur, apa itu kumur kumur? Kumur kumur. Uh, In English. Gargle, gargle. Gargle, gargle. You can use ecoenzyme. Okay. Yeah. But I already consult because my daughter is a dentist. She said, Ma, please don't use ecoenzyme to clean your teeth when the uh, when it still uh, feel, what is it, uh, acid. acid. Yeah, because ecoenzyme is, the pH is 3, so if you, we want to use it to gargle, just dilute it until the you cannot feel the as acid anymore. Because our teeth don't, don't want the, the acid situation. Okay? And if you want to clean your fishery, yeah, fish, fishery. fishery, okay. Uh, we already try uh, the what is it? The concentration. I mean, one liter of ecoenzyme for one cubic of water, okay. And we do it step by step because ecoenzyme it will, like I told you before, it kills the uh, bacteria, the fungi in the water. Uh, 
uh, because my background also about animals, so uh, I already uh, what is it review uh, a paper related to fishery of my students, and fishery is uh, somehow come by the fungi on the yeah. inside. Yeah, yeah. 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 The mouth, the eyes, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, just use the echo enzyme. Not only just read it the SOP, but use it, use it uh, consistently. Like me, uh, I already three years use echo enzyme for uh, many of my uh, tasks. Okay. Mm. I have a following question. So, let's say we use it for treatment our treatment of our discharge water, right? We concentrate the sediment pond with aqua enzyme, and then what happens next? Is this is this water safe to be reintroduced into back into the environment? And then for the aqua enzyme production, of course we have all this uh, fermented fermented waste. Um, how how should we deal with the nutrients? Yeah, that's it. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, echo enzyme contains of nutrients. Contain of nutrients, you know that. Uh, yeah, the enzyme itself it process from the protein as an amino amino acid. So, even though the concentration is not as much as the commercial one, but uh, in the long term, it could affect better. Uh, instead of the uh, chemical, the commercial one, uh, because uh, if we if we want to have a to have a sustainability environment, it's better if we use organic as much as we can. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Nuzaina. I'm afraid the time is very limited. Okay, we, we can have discussion tomorrow, yeah, on the way to Japara. Okay. That will be much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Nuzaina is brings many eco enzyme. Maybe okay. Dr. Nuzaina could explain to yeah. us what is this? Ah, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are 13 of you who come upstairs before, I ask the 13 to come again and have, I bring my with me the echo enzyme, yeah. So, yes, 13 countries 13. as the participants today, you will get one of this, mm. but please different people than the representatives that we already have previous on the declaration. Different people, okay. <laughs> okay. So this is an eco enzyme. So make sure don't drink this, although this is in a bottle, because <laughs> your body will get contaminated. <laughs> okay, from Indonesia maybe? the representatives of Indonesia, other than Fian, of course. Other than Fian. Okay, it's okay, come forward. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay, um, before we grieve this for free, 
would like to invite those three who asked to Dr. Nurzaina before, Daka, Daniel, and, oh, there are four. Okay. Okay, four of you, please come forward. And also the one next to Fian from Uganda. This kind of echo enzyme is processed from the orange citrus, uh, yeah, citrus waste. Uh, we just harvest this one on uh, September. September. So this is a fresh one. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can try it. Yeah, it's already three months old. More than three months. Okay. Okay. And this is the card of Dr. Nurzaina. So make sure if you need it, you can call, give a call. <laughs> or email, okay. Or send an email. Okay, for the others, citrusy. Okay, the smell is citrusy. That's the clue. <laughs> Orange juice. I'm not sure with the smell of them. Because <laughs> Daniel said citrusy. Daka said orange juice. <laughs> This is very acid, so make sure don't drink this bottle of eco enzyme. We still have um, more bottles to give, so maybe Malaysia. Who wants to bring this one cute little bottle eco enzyme? Uzbekistan. Yeah. Don't drink this because this is it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay um, I don't know. Countries. Pakistan. Thailand. Madagascar. Yeah, please take one. We still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight more bottles. Australia, Stephanie, would you like to bring this little cute bottle home to Australia? Who else? Um, which country? That Rwanda. Okay. France Marius. I'm sorry <laughs> to surprise you. But your friend here said France, so <laughs> make sure don't drink this. 
because <laughs> this is acid. Okay, we still have five more bottles. Five more bottles and one cart. Zahir. Zahir. Who's Zahir? That there's Nur Zaina is calling you. <laughs> Mama is calling you. You know, I feel like I'm selling something and nobody wants to buy it. <laughs> so yeah, but I'm sorry for the cut. Uh, we run off the cut, so sama sama. Sabrina juga mau juga. Oh yeah. Okay, so we have two more bottles. Maybe from Undip, Prof Jaini, mungkin. No. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, please come forward. Fundy, I'll fundy. Okay, we still have one more. Okay, it's done. I can home now. <laughs> Are we gonna have a picture? Okay. Um, I'm not sure with the angle of the picture. <laughs> Please, closer, closer, closer. Padini. Padini loves to take pictures, but don't really love to be take pic. Once again, thank you very much for Dr. Nur Zaina for explaining, sharing the eco-enzyme further and deeper. I personally didn't understand about the eco-enzyme, but I guess I... Guys, before we end this session, I would like to inform you that we have some posters that we already displayed or installed in front of this meeting room at the pre-function area. Please go check and see and vote which poster that you like, that you feel it represents you maybe. Please vote, there is a box inside um, within the poster and then you can just vote for the poster and then tomorrow we will reveal who's gonna win the best poster so please make sure to go and see the posters and vote for the poster and later on at seven after the break we still have one more keynote speaker but later, after the break, I'm oh, sorry, after the speaker, we will have an art performance. And there will be many performers will perform on the art performance. And okay, I think we have someone that will explain to us what we need to do or how we being part of that art performance. All right, good afternoon, everybody, delegates. So let me introduce myself first. My name is Wira, and I'm here, one of the organizing, organizing committee that is uh, responsible for our last agenda uh, today, which is the art performance. So uh, for uh, in the art performance, there will be a fashion show for, that will be done by all of you, from all, all delegates. Um, so I'm just going to explain about the technical, about how to do the uh, fashion show. So uh, there will be table like this, 
So uh, the table is going to be divided in three. I mean, uh, the right, middle, and the left. So please uh, be aware of the table that you're sitting uh, after the dinner. And then, uh, so uh, I'm just going to write, going to explain about how the path that you are going to walk for the for the fashion show. So there will be some uh, committee that will approach your table when it sits your time to walk uh, around the, uh, the the path, the aisle. So there will be Cahyani right here. Can you stand up? Right. So Cahyani here is going to explain about the path. So let's say you uh, you are sit from in this table, this one. Cahyani, this one. Right. So there is Dian here. Uh, Mbak Dian, can you uh, raise your hand? Yeah, uh, she is going to be the uh, committee that will approach you to tell that uh, this is your time to walk. So, Dian, you may approach. So, this is an illustration that all participants need to do during the fashion show. Yep, that's okay. right. So, okay. uh, all the delegates in one table should uh, walk in one line according to the route that Cahya Nidir has uh, doing it right now. And then uh, stop there for a minute. And then look, uh, so for the first order, I mean, let's say this table is the first one. Uh, you, just, you, uh, you, you can just go through it. But uh, the second, third, and uh, after, uh, this, uh, after the second table, you must hold uh, right there first. And then there is uh, another committee, uh, Mutia, right there that will tell you when to go right here. So Cahyani, you can go right here, continue. And then right to the front. And then when uh, you guys all have arrived at, uh, at the front, you may like wave, or if you have like some like uh, things to say, I mean like what do you call it? Uh, yeah, just some uh, some stuff, some sm short stuff that you need to say. Uh, it's okay, and then you may uh, w get back to your seat. So for the the one who is sitting in this uh, table and the middle table, uh, you go first to the this aisle, while the one who sitting in the left side ta left side uh, left side table. Just go uh, straight through forward. After then, after uh, after you have reached uh, the front, just go back through the right aisle. Well, I guess that's a brief uh, explanation. But I guess there, if there is any questions, uh, yeah, you may ask. Okay, I want to ask: them. Are they need to dress up for the fashion show? Yeah, uh, I have briefed that uh, all the delegates are wearing their traditional uniforms. I guess. Traditional costume, okay. Yeah. So this participants on this side, they will walk after this, this side yeah. finish or done with the walk. Yep. And then they will continue to walk behind them. Yes. Okay. Anyone, any questions for the art performance? So, so for the girls, okay. I want to ask, do we need to wear the traditional costume right after the break? So during the keynote speaker uh, speech as well, or do we have time to change again? Uh, I guess uh, you just get like, uh, you can uh, when the, what do you call it, uh, the keynote the speaker. Keynote. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so after break and then we already yeah. show up in our yeah. traditional costume. So you costume. don't have to go ahead. Okay, to thank you. Okay. Is there any more questions? Anything to be clear of? Right. Uh, if it's clear, um, uh, I want to say uh, so for all the delegates to please uh, at the evening dinner, please uh, just fill the tables in the front first. So uh, it will be easier for us to walk. And then, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, if there is no more questions, uh, thank you. I will uh, give back to the master of ceremony. Thank you. Okay. So for the girls, make sure to look beautiful and dressed up. And for the boys, make sure to look handsome for the fashion show. Daniel, I'm sure you <laughs> you're gonna be great. <laughs> okay, guys. And once again, don't forget we have posters 
outside, five posters, please go check and see and vote. Tomorrow we will announce the winner for the best posters. Okay, now you are allowed to have a break. We will return to the meeting room at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Okay, for the dinner time, start at 6 p.m. And for the meeting room or next session, will be started at 7 p.m. Thank you. After this, and our keynote speaker will speak about students role in sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Vice Chair of Program, Communication and Partnership, UI Green Metric, Dr. Junaidi SSMA. Uh, Dr. Junaidi, maybe I will deliver a brief biography of Dr. Junaidi. Dr. Junaidi graduated a PhD in Linguistics at Universitas Indonesia. He has been actively involved in the internationalization of Universitas Indonesia from 2004 to 2015 with different university positions. He was 2011 to 2015, was the head of Universitas Indonesia International Office and chairperson of Asian University Network Asian Credit Transfer System. He is also one of the resource persons for the internationalization of Indonesian universities at the Ministry of Education and Culture Republic of Indonesia since 2010. In 2021, he was founder of Indonesian International Student Mobility Awards, a new initiative of MoECRT to send undergraduate students to study one semester at top universities around the world. Now he is a deputy chair to Campus Merdeka, and since 2015, and he is an Vice Chair of UI Green Metric World University Ranking and also founder of UI Green Metric World University Rankings Network in 2016. Since then, he has been an international speaker at different UI Green Metric national workshops in different countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Junaidi Emma. Thank you. Can I have the slide, please? Please wait for my slides. Okay, so while we are waiting, um, first um, let me introduce myself once again. So my name is Junaidi. So um, um, I'm very delighted to be here with uh, all of you who come from uh, different countries. So uh, let me um, ask uh, anyone from uh, Africa, raise your hand, please. Okay, hello. Uh, anyone from Europe? 
Oh, hi. Okay. Anyone from Asia? <laughs> okay. Okay, to be more specific, uh, anyone from Central Asia? Okay. Anyone from Southeast Asia? Uh, South Asia? South Asia, okay. Anyone from um, Australia? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so from Australia, okay. Right. So thank you very much. Um, so um, I hope you have enjoyed uh, the program that we have for two days. Um, for the first international student leaders uh, meeting. So how do you find the program so far? Our colleague from uh, Uzbekistan. Good evening, everyone. It was very useful, beneficial, and friendly atmosphere. I gained a lot. I won't thank anyone who organized it. Thank you. So I hope you um, enjoy the program. So my topic today uh, is about uh, students' roles in sustainability. Um, so I think uh, this is a very important uh, part of the green metric of our network uh, that is to focus on you, uh, the students. Um, you, you play uh, very uh, important roles in university uh, in case you don't realize that uh, and also of, uh, of course for the nations or uh, your own country um, as you will be the future leaders of uh, your own country so students is very important uh, that's why today i'd like to talk a little bit about uh, students role in the uh, in the world especially in the higher education institutions um, if you could uh, uh, go to the next slide. So this is our world now. Um, if you can see, we face uh, many common challenges. So nowadays, uh, no man is an island, says Don Don. Uh, that's the, uh, the English poet. So um, why, uh, whether you live in Australia, in Africa, in Asia, or in Latin America, North America, we are all connected, whether we like it or not. You know? So what happened uh, with one country would affect another country. Okay? So for example, the war between Ukraine and Russia affects all of us. You know, uh, the inflation, the recession, so, and also the food security. Uh, also affects all of us. So um, that's the first one. Uh, we also face issues of water, energy. So you know, in different parts of the world, some countries um, have difficulties with water. Some uh, difficulties with water, but in a different uh, way. So some experience drought, some experience flood. So it's too extreme, right? So, and also we face, everybody knows climate change. So climate change uh, is real. So when I was a kid, uh, elementary or junior high school, there is a specific question about in Indonesia. So when is the dry season and when is the rainy season? Now we cannot answer that. <laughs> You know, because now it's raining and we don't know whether it's rainy or dry season. So everything is changing now uh, with the climate change. Uh, and each of us uh, contribute to this. So uh, even us, <laughs> when we fly here, we contribute to the carbon footprint. However, of course, um, 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 uh, it's a very difficult question uh, for some people uh, with the carbon footprint 
whether we need to travel here or we do it through Zoom and so on. Uh, but I think uh, uh, for certain reason, um, uh, it's all right to travel here, but we should compensate with the impact. Okay. Uh, next, we have pollution. Uh, sorry, can you go back please? Uh, okay, so we have pollution. We have the aging society. Uh, aging populations. Now, uh, in case of Indonesia and I think in Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia uh, has a demographic bonus until 2030. So by demographic bonus, I mean um, the productive age, uh, you know, people with the productive age uh, uh, would be high in Indonesia uh, until 2030. And if everything turns right, by 2045, Indonesia will be in the fifth largest economies in the world. Uh, then, of course, you need human resources and so on. But, you know, the world is now packed. I think more than 8 million billion people live on Earth. And some countries uh, still uh, keep producing. Uh, you know, um, this uh, I mean, um, um, populations, uh, but also in some other countries, uh, they have the aging population. So um, I think it happens in uh, Europe, in some parts of Asia, Japan, uh, Korea, they are aging society, uh, Germany uh, also. So it brings consequences um, and and issues of equality. Uh, next, uh, pandemics, everybody knows. Uh, it affects everybody. Um, now we can travel, but before that, for example, uh, two years ago, we cannot travel to Melbourne because it's locked down. Uh, we cannot go to um, the other countries uh, because it's like locked down, also in Indonesia. Although uh, Indonesia has a decrease, um, a little but now it's increasing so the pandemic is still there so it many facts everybody um, can you go back please okay uh, okay now we have inequality and poverty and also natural disasters so if you could join me um, a while to uh, remember the you know the earthquake that just happened in Tianjur. Um, I think uh, more than 700 people uh, lost their life. So let's pray for them uh, a while. Okay. So natural disasters and also the education. So these are the challenges that we face now, and they are real. Okay. So now. The question is about the universities. We are all at the universities. What are our roles as a students? What are your roles uh, for this? Okay. Uh, so, uh, as Tilbury mentions, higher education institution must transform it itself. Okay. So that means, uh, including the students, uh, the university has to be relevant to our society. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so that's why uh, we have the green metric. So the green metric uh, is the ranking from the point of view of the ranking. It's one of the ranking uh, in the world and it's the first university ranking for sustainability. Uh, most, uh, I think uh, most of your universities have participated in the, the green metric uh, ranking. Okay. Uh, next slide. So uh, if you see the rankings, you have this uh, um, uh, different types of the ranking. Okay, next slide, please. Now uh, let me move on to the next uh, topics. Ah, this is the green metric and the SDGs. So everybody knows the SDGs. Uh, how many SDGs are there? Uh, 17. Very good. Okay. So uh, in the green metric, we try to synthesize the SDGs and the green metric. 
So the formula would be like this. Uh, we focus on the setting infrastructure, waste, water, transportation, energy, education, and research. So next time you check your university and see why they are doing uh, different things at your university, uh, probably that's because of the grid mapping. So they have to complete the questionnaire and the, the questionnaire it works like a roadmap for the university to transform themselves to be more sustainable. Okay. Now the methodology, uh, if you see setting, infrastructure, energy, they all got the percentage. Uh, so in the percentage, uh, uh, we have a different uh, indicators and the criteria. Okay. Now let me continue. So our network. So at the moment, we have about 1,047 universities in 84 countries, okay, uh, as part of the network. So that means for you as a student, this is the possibility to network with 84 countries, 1,047 countries around the world. So uh, you can develop later um, you know, um, uh, network or you can work together, develop activities, you know, with your friends here. Uh, and also other friends who maybe um, uh, who cannot join us uh, tonight or um, on this event. So this is the network. Uh, your lecturers, your universities are also networking uh, in our process um, to transform the university to be sustainable. Now, uh, this network hopefully uh, would help the world, uh, you know, to uh, change um, uh, the course of the event, if you like, so that our world um, has a chance uh, to breathe for a while, you know, uh, because of the increasing number of the population. Okay. Next slide. So now, this is the main point of my talk, the students' roles in sustainability. So, what are your roles in sustainability? Right. Hi. Hey, um, in my opinion, uh, as a student, our roles in sorry. <laughs> Alright, so our role in sustainability is actually um, leading it. In my opinion, that's me. We, we're as the um, younger generations, as the youth, we're actually supposed to be an example, lead by example um, towards the older generations and the coming generations. So actually that's our role as students. So we're um, in higher education, so we know um, the uh, importance of uh, sustainability. So as a student, we have to lead by example. Thank you very much. So these are the roles uh, of you uh, in sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So in the green metric, we have identified several roles for you uh, in the indicators. So uh, from energy, waste, transportation, education, and so on. Uh, and then from that, the most important, I would say, uh, your activities with sustainability. So uh, you need to be more active in your university to do more activities uh, on sustainability. Uh, next slide. So at least there are three roles uh, for sustainability for you. The first one is you need to understand how important sustainability is. The second one is you need to participate and be active in implementing sustainability. Uh, and the last one, um, I think you need to uh, be more active in your uh, university as well as in the surrounding environment. Okay. Uh, now, how do you do that? Next slide. Okay, next slide, please. 
So one of the ways is to understand how important sustainability is, is for you to find more information about sustainability. Okay. One of the ways is join the many courses in Green Metric, for example, we have online courses on uh, sustainability. So um, you can ask your professors to you know, uh, create programs like this uh, uh, at your universities or in our network. Uh, so this is uh, the example. Uh, next slide. So this is in Indonesia. So we have online courses to explain about uh, SDGs. Okay, next slide. Now, the second one is you need to participate and be active uh, in implementing sustainability. So start from yourself and your friends, so then uh, see what you can do. Next slide. So this is the example in different universities uh, in Dublin, in Ireland. So you have, uh, well, some demonstration or protesting. Uh, in Ireland, and I think there is an example of uh, Thailand, uh, mangrove, uh, you know, planting the mangrove, which we're going to do tomorrow, I suppose, yeah. So that is another uh, example of that we can do. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, in Latin America. Uh, so you can have uh, uh, courses, training courses, or planting the trees would be easy way. Uh, you know, so um, if we can plant more trees, um, I think that would help uh, in your neighborhood or in your university or in other area. Uh, do uh, more like uh, reforestation uh, that would be helpful. Okay, uh, then you can talk with the community as well. Okay, as a students, you can go to the community and do some activities with them. Uh, to make them more aware about this issue. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is another activity, uh, student society, uh, so food for thought, and you see uh, the green initiative, the plastic campaign, uh, and then you can also uh, have other, you know, uh, Riverbank clean up, maybe uh, in Indonesia or in other parts of the uh, country, um, you can do the, the clean up, uh, the river or the, you know, and others. Um, um, make sure the trash are not on the street and all that. Okay, next slide. Okay, the last one, participate in driving sustainability in the campus environment and society. So you need to take uh, an active role in your university. Talk to your uh, green office if you have one sustainable office and ask them what you can do as a student. So for example, this is in the uh, University of Groningen in Netherlands. So they have this roadmap, you know, uh, circular residual waste, uh, less water use behavior. So from the roadmap here, you can choose which one you can take part and contribute. So for example, 95% um, um, waste separation, so you can uh, you know, easily take part on this event. Um, you know, tell your friends that they need to separate, uh, do the three R or the four R uh, on campus. So that's the thing you can do. Next slide. So this is the another example. So for example, uh, mobility, so um, encourage your friends to make uh, choices, sustainable choices. So for example, uh, you know, instead of driving your car alone, so maybe you can uh, invite other friends to join you or use the scooter or, you know, uh, electricity, bicycle. Bicycle would be good uh, for you also. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, but you need to be, uh, you know, see your campus as well. If it is hilly, uh, so be careful. <laughs> uh, you can walk, for example. So it's very uh, sustainable. Uh, at the same time, it's also uh, very uh, healthy. So depending on the context of your campus. Okay. So next slide. So this is uh, um, another example uh, that you can do. 
Um, so uh, think about what you can do at your university and work together with your university sustainability office and uh, do something uh, among yourself and start making an impact. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's continue. Next slide. So, yes, so uh, that comes to um, my conclusion. So I think uh, aware in the, this is the quotation from uh, Rapuni and Haft, uh, aware individual need to take charge of collective responsibility uh, to deliver more equality to the next generation. So the point is um, we have intergeneration uh, responsibility. So we would like uh, the next generation your kids, your grandchildren have um, the same, if not better, um, environment uh, for them to live. So this is our responsibility. What you do now will determine what happens in the future. Okay? So as a student, uh, I urge you to do something um, that you can do, work in your university, uh, and start making an impact. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, I give you some ideas, uh, some insights uh, on your role as a student. Uh, our life, our next generation will depend uh, on what we do uh, today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Junaidi. I heard that Dr. Junaidi has something important to tell to participants oh, yeah. and also the distinct. Are we online? Are we online? Ah. Okay. So as you know, uh, this is the first international student leaders meeting of the UI Green Method. Next year, we will have the second international student leaders meeting. Can you guess where we going? Malaysia? No. No, we going out. We going abroad. Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> no. 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 We're going to Central Asia. Uh, well, <laughs> don't spoil the surprise. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So next year, we're going to Uzbekistan. <laughs> so we're going to uh, Bukhari uh, State University in uh, Uzbekistan. So uh, hopefully uh, you can inform your friends or, or even yourself uh, to join uh, for next year to uh, Uzbekistan. Inshallah. Okay. So I'll give applause to Uzbekistan. Okay. Um, <laughs> so as you know, in the green metric, uh, we take turns in hosting the event. Okay. So um, uh, we have uh, different activities. The National Student Leaders Meeting uh, last week in Indonesia uh, from uh, Sultan uh, Sultan Agung Kutayasa, okay, uh, and then we also have the international workshop. Uh, this year, the international workshop is in uh, Taiwan. Last year was in Malaysia, in UPM. Uh, next year, we're going to Europe to Portugal. 
Yeah. After Portugal, uh, the international workshop of Green Metric would be in Colombia. In 2025, we'll go to Chile. <laughs> so for the international workshop. So there are many activities here uh, in the Green Metric Network. And I do hope that for you, you could talk to your office or your vice rector and so on. And perhaps uh, they would like to host an uh, event in your country. So please let us know. Do we have the connection, Sabrina? Oh, okay. So um, uh, let's listen to the art performances before we have our special guest from uh, Bukhari State University who will join us uh, uh, I think in the next 15 minutes. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Junaidi. So congratulations for Uzbekistan. We're going to fly to Uzbekistan. <laughs> okay. Now the time that maybe many of you waiting for, because you all dressed up very beautifully, very handsome and gorgeous for tonight, art performance. And hold on, it's supposed to be, yeah, there will be many art performances that are going to be performed tonight. Traditional song from one of the choir at the faculty, and then we have theater. We have also a fashion show, that's why you're wearing traditional costume tonight. And then we also have another traditional dance, um, choir, and so on. So it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be there are two MCs that are going to be host for the art performance. Can we invite them? Yes, thank you. And we're supposed to have an um, online connection with Uzbekistan, but it seems that uh, the vice rector is still busy there. Okay, so we will try later, but we're just going to enjoy the art performance. Okay, we're still waiting for the all the presenters to be ready for the art performance. Oh yeah, once again, don't forget about tomorrow because we have a field trip to Japata. It takes about three hours by bus. Yeah, and make sure you wear the white T-shirt that you already got on the first uh, on the first day. So make sure you wear something comfortable, casual, dress. I heard that probably tomorrow is going to be rainy. Maybe. Maybe. And tomorrow. And the plan is tomorrow we will we'll start. Seven. Okay, everyone needs to be ready before seven because at seven we will travel to Japara by bus. How many buses? Two buses and two buses with fifteen fifty? Wow, that's a huge bus. Fifty seats? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, so don't forget about tomorrow. So before seven, please be ready at the lobby of the hotel and wear your white T-shirt. Um, what else? With comfortable shoes, clothes, 
pants. My suggestion: don't wear a dress because we're gonna we're gonna plant mangroves. We're gonna play dirty. <laughs> okay, make sure to bring extra pants. <laughs> Are they ready for the dancers? Okay, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ratu Jaro Salman Dance. Salamu
honorable guests and delegates from all around the world, we welcome you to the beautiful city of Smarang and our beloved institution, the Ponegoro University. How's everyone tonight? I'm seeing a lot of happy faces here. I probably had a good dinner so far, I see. <laughs> we hope you're settling very comfortably for this very evening. It's been a whole day following the series of ISLM programs, and we hope that your enthusiasm is still staying for our big event. I know we are Sukarwendi. It will not be complete without the proper introduction. Maybe you can first? Oh, all right. My name is Mandy Christie, and I will be accompanied by my lovely partner. Okay. My name is Muhammad Rasel Farhan Ardani. You can call me Rasel. As we will be the masters of ceremonies for tonight's event. Woo. While seeing the enthusiasm from all of you participants, maybe we can start saying hello here from several countries now. If we start saying the name of those countries, the representative can give us a shout out, okay? Okay, first, from Malaysia. <laughs> All right, I see you. Pakistan. Oh, uh, come on, Pakistan, you got this, come on. <laughs> Next, Thailand. <laughs> Indonesia. All right, home country. <laughs> Next, Madagascar. Budapest. <laughs> Uzbekistan. Iraq. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uganda. We see. Australia. Okay, okay. Rwanda. France. Oh, okay. France is quiet. Okay. Sudan. And last but not least, Somalia. Okay, we're happy today. Let us not forget to congratulate the winning delegates from International Student Leader Meeting 2022, as it is certainly an honor to be a delegate carrying the name of their country in this event. By the way, what is ISLM actually? Well, International Student Leader Meeting is a forum for youths where they are positioned as agents of change and also the future generation of our nation. United in achieving sustainable development goals or as you would know them, SDGs, and solve critical issues that our countries face nowadays say, economic crises, food crises, wars between regions. Climate change. And climate change, the threat of it already dawning on us. However, this, year, this year's art performance theme is quite interesting, don't you think so? But I can't put my finger on it. What was it called again? Okay, to answer your question, the art performing theme is called Bring Back World Splendor. All right, all right, of course, it jogs my memory. This year's theme focuses on solidarity that is established not through uniformity, but through the respect, appreciation, and collaboration of diversity itself, so that as a united force, we can achieve a common goal. An amazing revelation. Now that is clear up, let's discuss the series of performance we have lined up tonight. Mm, all right. First, opening. Choir performance. Monologue performance. Fashion show. Impressional message. And last, closing, closing and, and sing along. Oh, well, this seems exciting today. I can't wait to start on the next performing. Oh, me too. I can't wait as well. But don't you think we should start asking the audience here? All right. So we're seeing one of you here that are really 
you know, Titsi that wants to talk, maybe? And All then, right. maybe? I think someone is shifting their seat so that they don't get chosen. <laughs> okay, I see that one now. Maybe you would like to go over there? All right. Hello, hello, hello. So you have been chosen. Now, we're curious. After today, you have all been going through so many activities. Okay, so what have you done so far? Okay, um, so far, uh, I've listened to many beautiful uh, and informative speeches, ate quite a lot, mm -hmm. uh, met and socialized with many different uh, personalities through, uh, from all over the world, learned about many different cultures, and yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked for tonight. All right. Thank you so much for your feedback. Okay, hey there. So, we will witness an Indonesian choir that has gone international, namely the Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir, celebrating the their success. They achieved the first place in the Grand Prix oh. Champion at 18 Busan Choral Festival and Competition just yesterday. How amazing is that? A truly astounding achievement. I'm even more excited to watch them perform for all of us. Now, what songs do you think the Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir will sing for us tonight? For tonight, the Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir will bring three consecutive songs, oh. such as Dawn and Dust 2, Lir Ilir and Bingo. Dawn and Dusk 2, or in Indonesia, we would call it Fajar dan Senja 2. The composer, Ken Steven, delivers an atmosphere of magical moments beginning to the end with a variety of vocal colors and hand percussions. The music that he describes is the atmosphere of folk life manifesting into a lively interpretation of sound. And it's Lir Ilir, an Indonesian folk song from Central Java with the composer Keva Satria. Lir Ilir's song was created by Raden Shahid, who was more known as Solan Kalijaga, when preaching to spread Islam in Java. And last, we have Penggong. Penggong is known as a folk song from the Manggara area, which is usually located in the East Nusa Tenggara. It is actually an expression in describing the unfortunate and poor life of the people of Manggarai who was under the rule of King Bima. Without, Without further ado, ado let, let us welcome, welcome the Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir.
Give her round of applause for Dibolo Goro Engineering Student Choir. Wow, their achievement, beautiful chorus, and coordinated choreography should encourage us to explore our talents as students. After that amazing performance from Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir, there will be another cool monologue performance from the Student Theater of Law Faculty, namely Themis. Monologue? That sounds very interesting. But before we continue, what a people the main title of the theater that will be shown is Beauty of Harmony, narrating the morals of the true meaning of mutual cooperation. But in Indonesia, this concept can be referred to Gotong Royong. Ooh, a very interesting story. It's making me both excited yet impatient to watch Termis perform. Let us know, welcome Termis with their title, Beauty of Harmony. Wait, wait for the light. Thank you, big man. That's kind of dangerous, fellas. Oh, sorry. Hey, what's your name? Oh, Nadila. Oh, my name's Kevin. Nice to meet you. great right now. Ah, the blue skies paired with the light breeze. It feels so nice having it brush and hug me. Hmm. You know, today feels like the perfect day to play. Yeah, you all agree with me. But now that I think about it, what game should I play? FIFA! Oh, sorry, but I don't play video games. You know, my mom told me video games rot the brain. And to be fair with you, I don't want to turn into a zombie. Well, how about anyone else? You guys know any other video games? Well, no, sorry, not video games. Any other cool games for cool people? Genshin! Ah, sorry, I think I know that game as well. And it's a video game. Like I said, no, I don't play no video games. It rots the mind. Anything like hide and seek or tag? Sorry, can you say that again, friend? Chopka? Hmm. I've never played it, but I can tell it's not my style. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I, from all the recommendations I've heard here, either it's not my style or it's just a boring old video game, 
And to be fair with you all, I've played every game out there, either by myself or with my friends. But you know, I remember a saying from my Indonesian class, Tak ada rotan, akar pun jadi. Which basically means, well, I am a kid. And as a kid, I don't really have the tools of a real architect. But with my toys, I can still make my dreams come true. With all that said, I think I know exactly what game I should play. Ta-da! Today, I'm going to build a building. Yes, you heard me right. Today, I'm going to build the most awesome, the greatest, the biggest building you have ever seen. And it's going to be able to fit so many people inside it. My buildings are going to make everyone inside feel so comfortable and secure. And most importantly, prosperous. So, let's start. Let's start playing building. I'm so tired. Why do the blocks feel so heavy suddenly? Huh. I don't think they were this heavy before. Huh. Why do they keep getting heavier and heavier? Is it my technique? Is it because of what I did? Uh, so confused. Uh. Dang it! You know, I was this close, this close to finishing my building. But the closer I get, the more boring it is. I don't want to play anymore. I mean, I did my hardest. I, I, I did all I could. But will all my work be for nothing?
Ha! I think I know exactly why those blocks feel so heavy. It wasn't because of how big the blocks are or how it was arranged. It was because I was doing it all by myself. A magnificent building, a great big building such as this one, should be built together. With teamwork and cooperation, we can finish any project faster and easier. That is why I want to ask all of you to come and help me finish my building and make my dream come true. Hey, miss, would you like to come and help me? All right, come on, please. Thank you very much. Come on, come up front. Thank you. Hey, mister, what's your name? Can you help me, please? Sorry? <laughs> Can you help me, please? Oh, thank you very much. You're the best person alive. Next to the girl. How about you, miss? Would you like to come and help me? Come on. Yeah, thank you very much. You're a cool friend. You're my new friend. Yeah, come on. Help me finish the building. Here, just put this there. Put this. Yeah, that one. Put it. Put it like. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah, like that. Uh huh. And connect the two pieces together, fellas. Come on. We're on a tight deadline here. <laughs> oh. Okay. This is the wrong piece. Uh. Let's see. Come on. Hey, this has to be a great building, all right? This has to be a, the coolest building in the world. Uh-huh. Oh, how about we just put it on top of here? Yeah, great idea! Oh my god. It is so cool. Oh, who cares about that? Okay, I think we are done. I think we have just created a masterpiece. And the little car on top? Yeah! Voila! Magnificent, beautiful, amazing! That is what this building is! Thanks to all my friends. Thank you all, Mr. and both Mrs. Thank you all for all your help. Oh, see, just like the old saying goes, berat sama dipikul, ringan sama dijinjing, which basically means many hands make lighter work, is true. With teamwork, I was able to complete my building. And here's the proof. It's perfect. Just a little bit on the top here. This is proof that the power of teamwork is real. Every prayer, hope, and dream can work together hand in hand to reach the farthest stars. This is the beauty of harmony.
Kris Jaya Let's give a big applause for Themis! Wow, so excited. With once our parents creating a meaningful and passionate performance that remind us of the principle of social. What is often referred to Indonesia is called Gotong Raya. I do share your sentiment, and it is a truly soulful and incredible performance from Themis. After this, there will be a performance that is no less amazing than all the previous ones, as we will invite you all to witness a fashion show. But, but, they will be accompanied alongside another group. Whoa. That soon's look interesting. Who will be accompanying the fashion show? They will be accompanied by none other than Deepo Negoro Orchestra. Awesome. And this fashion show will showcase 13 countries from 44 universities that have their own individual unique goods. Yes. And our fellow models are now getting ready for their best outfits. Without further ado, let us welcome the Fashion, Fashion Show with Diponegoro Orchestra!
give a big round of applause of all of you and Dibonogoro Orchestra with an interesting combination. Since we have seen a lot of performance from Dibonogoro University, friends, why don't we ask the audience? I think that's a good idea. Well, here we are again. Now we're gonna see which one will be the lucky pick. I see the big table right over there on the far right side. Okay. You're right there. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go over there? Let's yeah. go. Which one? Luckily, you guys are the lucky pick. Okay. Who's? What's your name? <laughs> and which delegation are you from? Okay, so my name is Jian Chaira and I am from Universitas Islam Indonesia. All right, so how do you feel about joining ISLM 2022 tonight? I'm so excited actually oh. because this is the first time I'm joining an international meeting. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I've met a lot of people here. Oh, you do? That's such a good thing. <laughs> All right, so out of all the performances we had so far, what, is, what has been your favorite? My favorite one is um, Chubihan Sti Taman Dance. Oh, the Rata Jara Dance. Oh, it is an incredible performance, though. Well, thank you so much. And okay, it is lovely. Thank you. Once again, oh. once more we choose a any mini mini i Red see someone tall are there maybe with the hat okay go okay <laughs> those with the hat are shifting their seats we see that over there and you are the lucky pick <laughs> okay so what's your name and please tell us your delegation okay uh, hello my name is mohsin mm -hmm. so i'm from uh, malaysia Malaysia. Malaysia. Okay, so we're going to same question. What has been your favorite performance so far? Favorite performance is the choir. The, uh, so I'm sorry. The choir. The choir. Oh uh, yes. So very interesting with the, the performance. The f oh, from the first performance. <laughs> uh, it does. It is such soulful and meaningful performance. And there's going to be another surprise after that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And now we were going to move on for the next performance. Okay, thank you, dear audience. Unfortunately, we have come close to the end of tonight. But before we continue to close the event, we are blessed to more performance from our wow. friends Diponogoro Engineering Student Choir as they will showcase a local traditional song from the city of Smara. The song is called Gambang Smara, Ooh. which tell us about four dancer and dancing together happily. This song is usually performed at special show. Wow, much like this one though. So let's give the Deep Deep Goto Goto Engineering Student Choir the floor.
and that audiences is the lovely performance of Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir with their song Gambang Smarang, an incredibly unique arrangement and great meaning that is conveyed to us. Yes, this prayer is true. It marks love the city even more, yeah? Oh, yes. Okay, well, it seems like we would like to hear their performance for one last time. Before that, we close this event. Well, of course, so. Uh, I think it's time to have everyone join in for this last song from Diponegoro Engineering Student Choir. Well, this specific song is actually one of my all-time favorites, which is Heal the World. Heal the World. That's my favorite song, too. That's your favorite, too? Yeah. Wow. Oh, but it just occurred to me, still quite sad because with this song, it will also close the event tonight, won't it? Definitely. But tonight has been a memorable to meet with all of the delegates from all around the world. We are seeing the amazing talents of Diponegoro University friends. Of course. I personally think, well, I can't even wait another moment for this sing-along. But before we continue, we would want to express our gratitude and apologies for any mistakes or misunderstandings we may have made throughout this event. We hope that you have enjoyed tonight's performances as well. And for this last song, we urge for all audiences to stand up. Come on, stand up, everyone. Join in for the song. Okay, we, as Master of Ceremony in International Student Leader Meeting 2022, are resigning. Let's close with our last tribute from us. And, and see you in International Student Leader Meeting next year.
Manchester. Okay. It seems like everyone loves to have an encore, right? A great, great encore. Okay. So, to fully close this special event like this one, it is not complete without a photo session. So please, audiences, if you would be in a polite file, we would come into the front so that we would have a joint photo session. So, okay, come on, everyone. Let's go. The committee will help you into a good formation for the photo session. It's all right. Please, it's okay. Yes. I'm not sure that we can capture all of the faces, so maybe we will divide it into two groups. Or as best as we can. <laughs> untuk teman-teman panitia, mohon bantuannya untuk bisa diatur ya. Supaya bisa muat semuanya. 